and welcome to those participating in the webinar. It is 1 p.m. on Thursday, October 19th, 2023, and I am Dr. Elisa Hannah. My pronouns are she, her, the chair of the Qualifications, Training, and Licensing Subcommittee for today's meeting. I am declaring that we do have a quorum present for our meeting today. The purpose of this meeting is to act on important business related to the practice of natural medicine medicine in the state of Colorado. The board will make its decision on agenda items today based upon written materials provided for its consideration in, in advance of this meeting. The public is welcome to listen. The public should not address the board unless requested by the board. As a friendly reminder to board members, please note that some of the material contained in the agenda packet may be deemed confidential. In, in addition, the board should not discuss legal advice previously received or seek legal guidance in any open session. Such matters will be moved into executive session for discussion. Members of the public will be asked to leave the meeting during the executive session. After an executive session, the board will vote on agenda items discussed in executive session. Before we get into roll call, I would like for participants who are able to please adjust their name on Zoom to indicate their pronouns. You can do this by clicking on the three dots while hovering your mouse over your image. All right, so moving into roll call, um, I'm Dr. Lisa Hannon, pronouns she, her, I'm present. Lundy? Hello, Lundy, pronouns are they, them. Glad to be here. Thanks for being here. Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes. Don't think that she has joined as of yet. Um, Dr. Sue Sicily. Uh, Sue, I'm present. I'm, I'll just, I couldn't change my pronouns, but there's she, her. Thank you. Dr. Sophia Chavez. Don't believe you that Should be on momentarily. She, she is on. It just sounds like I can see her. We just can't hear her. Okay. All right. Um, Billy Wynn? I'm here also working on the name change. My pronouns are Thank you. Thank you so much. Skippy Upton Mesero? Don't believe he's present. Today, he won't be joining. Dr. Brad Connor? I believe she is absent as well. And Stacy Lux. I am here and my pronouns are she, her. Thank you, Stacy. We appreciate it. Um, so, um, and then we should have Dominique Mendiola from DOR present. Maybe not. All right. Um, a few housekeeping items as we get started. I'd like to ask everyone to turn their cell phones to silent. And I'll now pass the floor to Lori Bratton. My name is Lori Bratton and I'm the program director of, uh, for the natural medicine program. Um, I think that the next item is the approval of the minutes. And just if you wanted to introduce any other door or DOR staff or AG staff, it's fun. Yes, the AG. Uh, Ashley. Hi, Lori. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley Muller from the AG's office, and I think I am the only one from our team here today. Sam? Oh, sorry. I'm Sam Brown. I'm in the Senior Advisor on Natural Medicine Services. And I believe we have uh, named uh, Weirs and Monica Silverland on as well. And, and uh, Dominique Mendiola will be joining us later. Looks like the Allison Robinette might be here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Allison is uh, from DOR. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so let's review the meeting minutes briefly together. Um, this is from our meeting on September 21st, 2023 at 1 p.m. And then I will ask for a motion to approve if there's no discussion. I'm moved to approve, and do we need to designate Lori for signing? Yes, thank you, Dr. Sisley. I'll second, Lundy. Thank you both. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, anyone um, declining? All right, thanks so much. So moved. Thanks. 
All right, so our next agenda item is introduction of non-voting subcommittee participants. Um, so I'll just ask folks to um, unmute themselves and introduce themselves. Um, please let us know your pronouns, where you're coming from. Um, so first on our list, we have Hadass Alterman. I don't believe that they're with us. Dr. Jamie Beachy. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jamie Beachy. Um, I am a board member for the Chikurna Institute. I also have a private practice with Wisdom Tree Medicine in Colorado. And I have a new affiliation, which is um, Field Scholar with the Emory University Center for Psychedelics and Spirituality. Nice okay. to be with you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Dickleachie, and congratulations on the new position. Um, James Eshelman. Hi, everyone. My name is James Eshelman. I'm um, founder of the Center of All Directions. Thank you. Luke Priel. Hi, I'm Luke Priel. I'm a former facilitator and trip sitter. Thank you. Sarah Gale. Hello, I'm Sarah Gale. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I Do I need to name all of my affiliations every meeting? I, I know I did it the first meeting, but do I just... Maybe a summary. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, um, MAPS uh, Harm Reduction Officer, uh, MAPS Public Benefit Corporation Lead Educator and um, Associate Supervisor, uh, Lead Facilitator at Integrative Psychiatry Institute, and Co-Founder and Board Member at Memoru Center for Visionary Healing Arts. Thank you so much, Sarah. Dr. Oh, Lynn, and, sorry. <laughs> and, um, uh, harm reduction representative at the Denver Psilocybin Mushroom Policy Review Panel. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Dr. Will Vanderveer. Everybody, I'm Dr. Will Vanderveer. I'm honored to be here. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a co founder of the Integrative Psychiatry Institute, which is a training group for psychedelic therapy and a medical director at the Integrative Psychiatry Clinic in Boulder, Colorado. Thank you. Cool. Um, Dr. Shannon Hughes. She's, I believe she's traveling. Okay. Dr. Matthew Kester. Hi, uh, I'm sorry I haven't started my video. It uh, looks like it was disabled uh, at the host end. So <laughs> I'm, oh, perfect. Thank you. You're wonderful. I put this out. Start up. Um, my name is Dr. Matthew Kester. Thanks for bearing with me there. Uh, I own uh, Science and Education and Formulary Chinese Medicine, and I also uh, am nationally board certified in Oriental Medicine, and uh, I've worked in the facilitation space in the past and look forward to see what comes in the future. So nice to see you all again. Thank you. Um, Jimmy Guy? Hi, everyone. My name is Jimmy Wynn. I use he, him pronouns. I'm here in Denver, Colorado. I am one of the two co-founders of Psychedelic Passage. Honored to be here. Thank you, and I'm sorry for butchering your name. That's totally okay. Austin Rao. That's funny. Also honored to be here. I am... Can you hear me okay? Yes. It's like I froze. Okay. Um, I'm a co-founder and head minister of Ceremonia. We're a psychedelic church based in Arvada that uh, facilitates um, an integrated protocol. Thank you so much. Um, Rochelle Gailey. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I work at the Behavioral Health Administration doing licensing and designation of treatment providers, uh, a licensed addiction counselor and licensed social worker. Thank you. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anita Kumar. Hi, everyone. New to the scene, Anita Kumar. I'm a psychiatry medical director at Access Health System and Community Mental Health from the Southwest Club. And my pronouns are she, her. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, Tasia Poinsanta. Hi, I am similarly struggling with the video and also the caption. Um, seems like, okay, here we go. 
Hi. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Uh, so my name is Tasha Poinsett. Uh, I am the state director for here in Colorado for a nonprofit called the Healing Advocacy Fund, whose mission is support, to support effective implementation of Proposition 122. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Josh Kappel. Hi, I'm Josh Kapp. I'm the senior advisor at the Healing Advocacy Fund. Um, I'm also a founding member of Vicente LLP, which is a law firm in Denver. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ben Malcolm. Hello, I'm Dr. Ben Malcolm, pronouns he, him. I'm a psychopharmacology consultant, psychedelic educator. I run a website, spiritpharmacist.com, that focuses on the kind of interface or interactions between mostly psychiatric medications and psychedelics. It's a real honor and pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, we're really happy to have you. Um, Ian C. He might be late if he's um, short. Okay, and then Alison Robinette. Thank you, Tanner. Good afternoon, board. Alison Robinette. I serve as the Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs of the Department of Revenue's Natural Medicine Division. And I use a uh, she, her. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's lovely to see our board growing and we're really excited um, to have all the non-voting participants here. Um, um, and it's going to be great to get some additional perspectives. So thank you for being here. Um, so our first agenda item is going back to our scope of practice review and discussion. Um, so before we open up this discussion, um, I want to remind everyone that this is a draft. Um, our goal is to be able to review this at the full board meeting tomorrow. Um, from that point, any recommendations that our board makes about the scope of practice will need to be submitted to DORA and DOR um, and go through the rulemaking um, process for further mo modification. And that will include um, uh, the ability to submit public comment and to get more stakeholder feedback. So this is considered a draft, I want to say that. Um, and it's not something that we're going to be implementing until it goes through all those processes. Um, I'm going to throw Dr. Malcolm a bit of a curveball, and I apologize for this, but a major point of feedback I, I need for this scope of practice kind of centers on um, the psychopharmacology piece. And I know that your agenda item wasn't until item four, but I was wondering, Dr. Malcolm, if you might be willing to speak a little bit sooner after we kind of look at this draft and the pieces that I think still need a little bit work. Sure. You, you told me what I need to do, and I'm here for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so there haven't I've, there haven't been major changes to this draft. Um, there's just been some minor things. So um, the big things were based on feedback from last meeting, um, which led to changes um, in that list of contraindications that might require kind of a higher level of facil of, of care involving a facilitator that also has a dual license that allows them to treat um, and diagnose illnesses. Um, so. Part of that feedback was asking to add a, some additional um, conditions into that list so that you'll see that if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that. Oh, back up, sorry. <laughs> Just right there. Yeah, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so this is um, in point four here towards the bottom. So we had added a couple of things. One, one of the pieces of feedback was adding um, severe suicidal behavior back in, we had taken that out, um, and adding severe symptoms of PTSD um, back in, uh, that was taken out. Um, the piece that I'm hoping Dr. Malcolm can help us clarify is there were some questions about, especially those physical um, contraindications on this list, um, if that needs to be modified. And so for those of you that are new to us, um, the idea here is that um, someone who is a licensed wellness natural medicine facilitator is someone who is not in the state of Colorado able to treat or diagnose illness. And the recommendation is going to be um, in this scope version of the scope of practice, that that person would need to work with a di different um, provider who was a facilitator, but also had the ability to treat and diagnose um, illnesses in order to provide care to folks that have these contraindications or um, send folk, um, participants who have these contraindications to 
um, a facilitator that is able to treat and diagnose illness in, in the state of Colorado. Um, so that was one major change. Um, another change had to do with some reorganization and some clarification um, based on some confusion about these different licenses. So now in that single um, facilitator license sphere, we've kind of dropped down to one subtype um, instead of multiple subtypes um, and added more language at the beginning talking about some types of individuals that would be included in this sphere. Um, yes, so I'd like to, to give us about 15 minutes for any discussion about this, and then I might ask Dr. Malcolm to proceed with his presentation, if that's okay. Yes, Wendy. So on the change related to a single facilitator working with a facilitator who can diagnose and treat, um, how do we want to consider scenarios such as um, last I understood, there is one psychiatrist in the San Luis Valley supporting 20,000 residents. So single facilitator access to facilitators who can diagnose and treat, particularly in parts of Colorado, where there is a significant inaccessibility of um, those kinds of providers. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important question. Uh -huh. What I would say is, first of all, we're not talking about treating everybody, right? We're talking about people on that specific list of contraindications. So um, really we're only talking about individuals with serious mental illness. So um, psychosis, bipolar disorder, serious PTSD. And you know, there was a question in the past about the PTSD piece and that's part of the reason I took that out. Um, it was recommended at last meeting that we put it back in. I just wanna clarify that. So it's not history of PTSD, right? I, I, what I envision our next step after all of this is creating this screening document. Really what I think we're talking about here is active diagnosis of PTSD. You meet criteria for severe PTSD right at this moment, then likely you shouldn't um, be working with a licensed wellness natural medicine facilitator by themselves independently. Um, yes, so those are the main things. And then these health conditions that seem to be contraindications. So again, I still think it's going to be the case that the vast majority of people seeking care do not fall in, in, the, in that list. And, and that's the hope. Yeah, Dr. Beachy. Hi, thank you for, for this. And I'm sorry if I missed this in your summary or in the document, but in the case of PTSD, severe PTSD with the, um, would, would the person who can diagnose and treat need to be in the room the entire time or, or is it similar to the MAPS protocol where it would be involved with, um, you know, <clears throat> medicine administration and, uh, and periodically involved, but not um, present for the entire session. But the language in here allows for someone to 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 treat with consultation with someone who has the ability to to diagnose and and treat illness. Um, there, so what's complicated there is, as a board, we've decided it shouldn't be just any MD or any um, LPC or psychologist who can facilitate that consultation, they also need a facilitator license. And so that's those other levels of licenses, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yes, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Lundy? Yeah. So again, I'm trying to come at this from a, one store is in a position of regulating these licenses. What are the things that could come up? And I know um, this has been a conversation in different contexts, but specifically related to what we're talking about with these changes. Um, how do we imagine navigating, you know, single facilitators within contexts that don't believe in the DSM? They don't believe in the same way in, in this idea of psychosis or PTSD. And, um, and that is, you know, a foundational worldview in, you know, in relationship with the world that you and I live in as licensed mental health therapists who are under the regulation of our licenses. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious about from a regulation standpoint, potential gaps there of how we can hold people accountable appropriately. I mean, I think again, that decision at the, in the screening process is still up to that single licensed facilitator, right? And so, um, you know, our recommendation is based, uh, you know, this list of contraindications is 
based on our best data, we don't have a lot, right, about w where this might be a really risky practice. Um, so, you know, if a single licensed facilitator decides to um, not follow that recommendation, I think they would be at risk um, for for coming before the board um, and having to to discuss their rationale for deciding to kind of disregard if we if we move forward with this with this model. I don't know if that answers your question, Wendy. Lucky. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you're waiting for me to respond. It yeah. does answer my question. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for that inclusion of how do we bridge worlds, right? Um, you and I are from a westernized model um, and we are opening the single facilitator to bridge worlds. And so I want us to be thoughtful um, in how that accountability process can sometimes um, negate people's worldviews um, while at the same time holding the responsibility to maintain the safety of the client like we're all responsible for. So I think more than anything, I just, those complexities are important to keep on the floor. So I appreciate you engaging and, and acknowledging that there's an inherent risk that is in the responsibility of the license holder. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Dr. Vanderbeer. Thank you. Um, two questions. The first one's a quick one based on Wendy's question is, um, to, are we, are we, you know, for example, a San Luis Valley one to, you know, to 20,000 people, uh, are we, are we saying that someone has to be involved in person for, for that consultation relationship to occur? Because, okay. And then I see you, you're shaking your head. Um, second question is who's going to evaluate the potential client for, for a lot of this, um, potentially complex history, if it's not the wellness provider. So. Oh, I think that the model would be, and we haven't created this yet, but there's a screening, a standardized screening that we're recommending folks use. So it may be the wellness provider at that screening level. And then that screening lets them know, you know, either I can proceed on my own or else know this individual has one of these contraindications. I either need to consult with a facilitator that is able to treat and diagnose or pass you know, refer this person to someone else if, if it feels like that is the level of complexity. You know, I, in terms of, um, you know, meeting virtually or in person, what I think about that is, that, um, again, the liability will fall back on that facilitator and it will likely be on um, the facilitator with a dual license, right, is, of making that decision. They're the one then crafting a treatment plan. They may decide like this person's high risk enough that we don't want um, a licensed wellness natural medicine facilitator providing the care. They may decide, no, I think that's okay with these parameters, but they're the one crafting that treatment plan um, using their other license in conjunction with their facilitator license. I don't know if that answers it, Dr. Vanderbeer. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Kester. Yeah, I just, uh, and you've been answering a lot of my questions here because this is my first chance to really take a look at this now as we're, as we're looking at it. And I guess I'm not sure still where there's a whole group of us that uh, when you mentioned there, there's the folks that can diagnose and treat illness. Uh, I can think of three groups of folks, um, East Asian medical professionals, naturopathic doctors, and chiropractors that can diagnose and treat you know, according to their scopes of practice, that would make them a useful, like as Lundy was speaking to, a useful bridge in this case, because, I mean, we have thousands of hours of training in terminal doctorates, uh, you know, so we're a little different than, let's say, um, uh, you know, massage therapist that's also in this group or somebody with no other license, uh, because we're used to referring and working in, in hospital, you know, in integrative settings quite a bit. And so kind of, where can we be of assistance and work in this picture? Because it kind of seems like we're getting, you know, we have a lot of tools that could help, especially in some of these areas that are healthcare deserts, because it's not that hard for us to look at somebody and be like, yeah, you need to be referred to a specialist for a greater level of care and a greater level of um, assessment. And so, you know, you can kind of see where my question is coming with this. And then also when you mentioned the screening, I'd be really curious to know, like, can you speak to the screening uh, that you're looking to adopt? Because I'm specifically interested, like, it, for me, with patients that I've had, 
cardiovascular risks are my most concern because of the 5-HT2 agonist, agonistic quality to a lot of these medic, uh, natural medications. Uh, and so I, I would just be curious, curious, like, are we assessing every time? Uh, how does it work for people like us that are kind of in this integrative space and have been for a while, but aren't listed here? You know, kind of what's the thought? And, and thanks for letting me ramble for a sec. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Castro. And then can you scroll down a little bit back to that paragraph that talks about the contra contraindications? So it's 0.4 right there. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, so 0 0.4 right there. Um, we haven't crafted the screening yet. That's our next step. When I, we're, we're working really hard, um, and I, I want to be mindful of this too. I'm going to definitely take more comments. But today I want to focus on that education piece because we need to get that rolling very soon. So I just want to be really clear about that. I want to keep this discussion to scope of practice a little bit smaller um, today than it has been in the past because we need to start hitting that education piece a little harder. Um, I'm really only talking about the people on this list in terms of being individuals that need to be working with someone with, with a dual license. And I hear what you're saying, Dr. Kester, about like, well, there should be another license. We actually had that in the last version last mm -hmm. time. And the feedback I got was that was too confusing. Dora didn't understand like what that, what I really meant by that. So what I would say is it's these issues that are in this paragraph, cardiovascular risk factors, diseases of the liver, seizure disorders, life-threatening illness, severe suicidal behavior, um, current PTSD, psychosis, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorders, or bipolar disorders, I would say those need to have some consultation with someone in that dual license sphere. Um, Absolutely. And everyone else is fair game. I right? take like yeah. work with them. That's great. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece I would add here is that um, I think you do have a lot to offer. And I think part of this is also like the way that we start to differentiate specializations and that happens in every field right i don't think we need to like regulate that specialization but in your advertising you're going to say yes i'm a i'm a facilitator and also these are the things i bring to the table that the average facilitator may not if that makes sense and you're perfectly within your rights to do that because you have those other certifications if that makes sense so it's really the folks and the very small group of folks that sounds like a lot of conditions but it's really um, you know when we look at the numbers this is a small number of people that would be in this group if that makes no, sense. and that makes sense and thank you and i guess just to be clear it's not so much um no like we're like so it's a big part of our our training too identify and refer for all of these things like i mean we spend a lot of time clinically working on all of this and treating it honestly but um just you know one of the things that the board has made clear and i, I really keep hearing is that you know access is going to be difficult in some of these areas and you know we're just when it comes to like the fields i just mentioned that are are um naturopathic east asian medicine and chiropractic you know we're just i i just feel like we have this we can be of assistance to you and to the board and i just want to make sure that we're not going to kind of get wrangled because I agree is train. I so much agree with the education. I want high levels of education and I'm just saying we can help fill this gap too, because this all makes sense to me. I would refer for all of these things for a workup as well. So that's, please know that I don't think that's odd or that we should be stepping into it. We say, we already know how to deal with it and work with, you know, our mental health professionals and our, our biomedical professionals. So, um, but as long as it gives us some room to work in there, I mean, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So. Thanks. Absolutely, Dr. Kessler, and I, I agree that all of those fields have a lot to offer in in, in in combination with natural medicine. So I'm hoping that people do pursue facilitator licenses from those fields. Um, you mentioned screening, and I just want to go back to that one more time. We haven't written it yet. Oregon does have a version, but the big things that have to be on it would be this list. Right? We have to be screening for these things on the outset to know where people kind of need to, to, to go for care. So I don't know yet, uh, we, but we will get there as soon as we can get this education piece finalized. Um, Ms. Poinsett? Thanks. Um, I'll try to keep this quick because I know you're trying to move on. Um, I realized in my intro, I forgot to mention also having worked on the campaign for Proposition 122 and serving on the steering committee. Um, and I just wanted to kind of highlight this addition of current PTSD in recognition that um, as we you know crafted this initiative, um, a huge part of the intent was to create access specifically for the veteran population. And I think it would really make a lot of sense to bring someone from that um, 
that community into this conversation to see how this might affect access considerations, especially taking into consideration what Lundy mentioned around um, access in rural areas and recognizing that a large proportion of our veterans in Colorado are located in rural areas. I wouldn't want to see us move um, forward with something that creates undue restriction for those individuals, um, many of whom are currently experiencing PTSD and are looking to this as an alternative option. Um, so one of the groups that comes to mind, I think, to, to bring into this conversation would be the Heroic Hearts Project um, that has already been working with veterans and I think probably has a perspective on how that could interface with the access considerations there. Thank you for that, Mr. And that's actually my background, right? Like uh, my, most of my career is in the VA on a PTSD clinical team. Um, and I had taken that piece out um, be, because I thought, well, maybe. Um, I want to say for, for that group of people, um, and we just didn't scroll through this whole document, the idea would be that they would get at least consultation with someone who has a mental health license, not necessarily an MDPA or an MP, someone who um, does behavioral health care. And that feedback was really coming from a lot of facilitators that had seen hundreds of cases and felt like trauma is, is an, a, a risky thing in, in the context of psilocybin if you don't have the training to deal with, with that presentation. Um, and, you know, this, this question of like, but they're not presenting for care for trauma, um, I think is an important one. I think the issue that I keep hearing from facilitators underground and otherwise is that trauma has a way of showing up sometimes for people when they're using psilocybin. And if someone doesn't know how to handle that, that could be re-traumatizing and have a really negative effect. So the idea here is that someone who understands trauma and PTSD should be involved in the treatment plan um, sort for cases where someone has current severe PTSD symptoms for that context. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And I hear you on all of that. And actually, we're um, in the presentation we're doing later, we'll definitely touch on um, findings around trauma that relate to what you're speaking to as well. I still think just from a process perspective, um, given that that could have significant implications for uh, these folks, bringing somebody in who has that direct experience and insight would, would make a lot of sense to have that voice included. Um, and I don't know if you the veteran status of the folks on this call, but I just wanted to, to highlight that. Thank you so much. Dr. Chavez? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what Dr. Kester was sharing about um, the the professional the groups that he was talking about that are familiar with the referral process and how to support this, this um, program, these services as we're moving forward. There are a lot of curanderos and curanderas, medicine men and women, who are also social workers, psychologists. They have other... Um, degrees and certifications and qualifications that, you know, they may not be out in the world like the traditional Chinese medicine, you know, and some of the the other professionals because, I mean, seriously, how often do you have, there's not a professional, there's a professional traditional Chinese medicine association. There are no traditional curandero associations, but they're out there. And, you know, that's one of the things that Lundy has talked about, which I really appreciate uh, the contributions that Lundy makes because, you know, as we move forward, and Lundy's right, the way that we see um, mental health and behavioral health is different, you know, and then now we're, we're talking about trauma as well. The majority of us who grew up um, connected to some of the barrios and the reservations and all these places, we are very familiar with trauma and trauma, you know, providing uh, care for those who have been traumatized in sweat lodges and in other healing circles, it presents itself. And like you said, very unexpectedly. And the majority of indigenous healers start to train when they're, um, as soon as they're, it's recognized that they have a thorn or they have a gift. So some start their training as early as in high school. And they start to be in environments where they're helping to take care of other community members. And so they're exposed to those trauma protocols at a very young age. And so when you do have someone that has an emotional release in a sweat lodge, an emotional release in just a talking circle, you never know when trauma is going to present itself. And so having that, that training, just keeping that um, understanding for the indigenous community and communities of color because we talked about um, applications at one of our meetings for facilitators versus the test. 
and within that application, demonstrating your years of experience. It's not just a referral by someone saying you can do it, by act, but by actually demonstrating with um, your experience. I, I think it was around 2007 when um, licensed massage therapists had to become, they had to become licensed. And I had been doing massage therapy for years before that, but at that point is when Dora said to me, we're gonna have, this is now changing into a licensed system. You need to show us where your training took place. You need to demonstrate the years of training and all of that. And that was something that I could do. And that's something that could be, that can happen with this application process that we're talking about. And then with regards to education, um, you know, we need to make sure that within that application process that we're just confirming that all of the indigenous healers and all of the, 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 the uh, individuals who are, have work, work in communities of color with their own cultural treatments, um, we, we need to help them be able to organize because a lot of them are trained, but they're not used to the Western model of how to categorize and document all of these things so that they meet the DORA standards. And, and we don't want to miss those individuals. that they are given credit and that they're supported in that application process. I, I just wanted to add that this is all gelling together very nicely, but I think that with the right support, sy support system, we can support the indigenous communities and communities of color as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. I really do appreciate that. And um, I, like I said, I hoped the heart of our, our discussion today could really focus on those education requirements. And one of the big questions is what do the accelerated education requirements look like? How do we help applicants make it through? And, and I agree with all your other points too. And I, I just appreciate you being here too. Thank you so much. Dr. Beachy. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chavez. I appreciate your comments as well and hope we can get to that. Just quickly, and I might actually defer to Dr. Vandiver in this, but you know, you have life-threatening conditions as one of those conditions, but I don't see anything here about just serious complex medical conditions, something like, um, you know, like Parkinson's disease or um, like early stage, like ALS or, I mean, there's all kinds of complex medical conditions that aren't necessarily life-threatening. And I'm just speaking from my background in palliative care. That's really helpful. So that's actually part of the advice I was hoping to get today and, and why I'm hoping to skip to Dr. Malcolm and then come back um, on our agenda because I need more information about this list of contraindications and whether this is comprehensive enough, or whether it's too restrictive. So thank you, Dr. Beachy. Um, Dr. Vanderveer? Uh, thank you. I agree with Dr. Beachy that there could be a distinction between end of life. I, I don't see that in here either um, versus life-threatening or complex illnesses. Um, I don't, I mean, if, if a person's at the end of their life, um, I, you know, I think that's a different situation with different risks and potential benefits versus someone with a complex medical condition um, that, you know, if if they had a bad outcome with psilocybin, could be a huge loss for them. Um, and then my big question, the reason I raised my hand was I want to support Dr. Chavez's point that there are different cultural contexts here. And I, I'm, I'm a little curious about... Um, an indigenous practitioner falling into this wellness category and then having to go attached to consultation with a person in a Western uh, framework versus, um, you know, a, a, an indigenous system of elders and consultation within the cultural framework that is consistent with the, uh, let's say, beginner um, indigenous uh, practitioner. Yeah, so I want to be really clear that we're not talking about the carve out for indigenous and religious practice. We're only talking about the regulated model. So I want to be very clear about that. So this would only be indigenous and spiritual practitioners that also decide they want a facilitator's license. And again, we're only talking about those contraindications here. So it wouldn't be broadly, it would be only in the case of those contraindications. So we we have talked a lot about this, and it and it has been it's very complex, right? Um, the hope is that indigenous and spiritual practitioners um, will feel like they have the ability to practice the way they always have. The difference would be if they decide to step in the regulated space, and only then would would this kind of go into effect. Thank you. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Wynn? 
Um, I'm hearing your need to get back to the agenda, but I wanted to take a couple of seconds to um, honor uh, Dr. Chavez's thoughts and further that to say that there's actually a lot of um, community models that actually address trauma, whether that's survivor advocacy support, advocacy support groups, family models, uh, community group models. And I, you know, have a fear that this type of language may actually restrict the ability for community holding of trauma. And the other point that I wanted to make is that I, I feel that in this section, um, you know, for here, that it actually may be actually vastly problematic to deny care and services to an individual for a certain mental health diagnosis or condition. Specifically for me, the point out is bipolar disorder, which I would love to hear from Dr. Ben Malcolm if there's actually like a medical contraindication or if that is within the realm of, okay, you need additional care because if this is going to preclude folks from bipolar, that's going to push those folks to the, the underground market. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there's a misunderstanding here. So part of the reason we're, we're creating this this kind of sphere model with multiple different types of licenses is we don't actually want to exclude anyone outright by re regulation. The idea is that someone with bipolar needs to be also working with someone who has a dual license. So a facilitator that's also licensed to treat and diagnose um, bipolar disorder. So it's not that they're denied care, it's that they're that if they are going to get care, it's going to have to be in consultation with a dual license in the dual license sphere. If that makes Thank sense. Thank you for clarifying that. I yeah. I still believe that that may create some some problematic issues, just knowing that individuals have their own sovereignty on what type of care that they want to receive. There's plenty of folks who actually approach their mental health through naturopathic services or gastrointestinal services, as an example. So I just wanted to invite that into this conversation. And that's why other mental health disorders are not included. So the reason we chose these ones is because this is what the data says about contraindications. But I want more information about contraindications as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So with that, Dr. Malcolm, would you be willing to, to um, give your talk about the contraindications and maybe some feedback? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I have a, a half hour. Is that? But we want to leave probably half of it just to chat. That's okay. Let's talk now. Here we go. Can all see it now? So I'm probably going to go through some of the first slides like really quickly. Like there's some of the information here that I think, you know, I heard that this slide deck is going to be part of the public record or something. So some of it is left there for like reference. And so if it seems like I'm going fast or skipping over stuff, it's because I want to get to the point where you guys get to ask the questions and we chat about it. So as far as like type, like, like when I hear like interaction or like contraindication, I think a lot of people are thinking contraindication like black and white, absolutely, yes, no. And there are some elements that probably should never be employed together or um, you could redefine that as elements that are too high risk to be employed together perhaps rather than never or speaking in you know these absolute terms. I like to think about it in like probability or like risk related terms instead of like yes, no uh, types of, of things. And I think that that does fit into this kind of like tiered discussion of different licensures or requirements for different types of persons with different types of conditions and and illnesses. I think that you should probably need to start with an intake form or maybe you have someone that's kind of like dual license, like they're a therapist and they, you know, take candidates out of their practice where they actually have a lot of rapport and knowledge of their background and and whatnot, and then they kind of do the intake form later as far as like collecting some sys systematic or like holistic information. But probably if I was just running a healing center, most things would start with a, a systematic kind of uh, intake form. I have more information on intake forms. This is an example of a branched template intake form down here. Um, I also have like a downloadable PDF intake form. I'm more than happy to like share this. I have thoughts about how things can work as far as maybe like checklist style questions. Like you go to a doctor's office. Have you ever had a history of 
seizures, heart attacks, strokes, like that, like that. It forces you to check a box. Yes, no, it doesn't rely on memory anymore, right? So there's probably some ways of asking questions on intake forms that allows us to not miss things or force persons to answer to certain stuff. And there can be um, a lot of nuance in intake forms too. Do you drink alcohol? Yes or no. If it's no, next question. Do you use tobacco? Yes or no, right? But if it's yes, how many drinks a week do you have? Okay, one or two, next section. Okay, seven to 14, do you ever have an eye opener or a drink first thing in the morning, right? You can ask questions that get to a greater level of nuance and detail without burdening the person that is just a no, I don't drink alcohol because they can bypass to the next section. So I got a lot of thoughts about that, but I don't think that's the point here. So this slide is not the contraindication slide, but it is the slide of psychiatric conditions or circumstances that have been excluded from most clinical trials. And it really depends on the type of clinical trial and what they're examining. So if we're running a clinical trial for refractory depression, they don't let people with active substance use disorders in that trial because it can confound their data. It makes things messy. It's hard for depression treatments to work when persons have active substance use disorders. Yet, if you're running a trial of psilocybin use for heavy alcohol or heavy drinking or alcohol use disorder, you're going to be exclusively selecting those types of persons. So the kind of medical and psychiatric exclusion as you see from clinical trials can be for a number of different reasons. It could be because we just think it's the risk is too high. It could be because that's not what we're studying in this trial. Or I think a, with a lot of the psychiatric or psychotropic medications, yeah, there's some that are risky, some that have true drug interactions, and some that just might be confounding variables. If I'm running a trial and trying to measure anxiety and depression, and I have and are permitting a bunch of other medications that could also work or impact anxiety, then it creates a very messy, randomized trial. And that's exactly the problem, is they're trying to have one variable in these types of trials, which makes it kind of a headache when we get to this point and we're trying to figure out how to generalize it to the real world, right? Because, well, the randomized trials got lots of internal validity, but as far as external validity or applicability to the type, all types of persons that we may come across, sometimes it leaves quite a bit to be uh, desired. Um, I guess like, I, you know, I write particularly bipolar one, as far as like a, a disorder, I have not seen data of psilocybin being helpful for bipolar two conditions with depression, but I can go to clinicaltrials.gov and see that the research is planned, it's been approved by ethics boards, and it is going to be happening, right? So at the very least, I know it is not unethical from a research perspective to treat a person with a bipolar two condition with something like a psychedelic assisted uh, therapy. I think we have some survey information out there in persons with bipolar conditions. And they most of the time say like, yeah, there was some risk that it impacted my sleep or gave me some sorts of hypomanic types of symptoms, but for what it did to my depression, that was well worth it, right? So I think a lot of persons with that bipolar two kind of condition where the mania is not severe at all, maybe it's questionable whether it's a bipolar diagnosis versus complex PTSD, right? There's lots of persons that have trauma, substance use disorder early in their kind of like 20s, and then by their mid to late 30s, they don't have the substance use disorder, they're in therapy, and the therapist's like, you don't have a bipolar condition, you've got trauma, right? So there's, I think with bipolar two conditions, there's a lot of room there for nuance, and I really do see a distinction between like a bipolar one type of condition and the level of risk that's ultimately being taken. Substance use disorders, I know you're supposed to come up with some things around that, right? The substance use disorders in clinical trials, it seems like psychedelics are helpful for that, but they universally involve some period of abstinence, even if it's a very short sort of like period, and a therapeutic framework that focuses on recovery. So same deal now from the medical or neurologic angle, you know, all the same things about confounding, maybe being higher risk, things apply to, to this list of conditions as well. So they list uncontrolled hypertension. They call hypertension the silent killer because most people are not diagnosed with it. So maybe if I ran a facilitator or a treatment center, maybe it would just be part of my practice that I get people and I calm them down and I wait for it's a good moment to take their blood pressure, but it might just be reasonable to take a baseline blood pressure before administering 
drug just to rule out the person that isn't going to their PCP and isn't getting any physical and ought to have hypertension. Right? It's like almost like the people that go to their doctor and get the diagnosis are the ones that are trying to really be safe about things. And you may get people that just don't go to healthcare and don't see doctors and don't even know what kind of conditions or problems that they, they, they really have. And I think particularly in the realm of cardiovascular illnesses, that could be true. I think it's really difficult. And I'm, I'm a psychiatric pharmacist. I know a little bit about cardiovascular things, probably more than an average pharmacist because of my residency trainings. But there's so much here that gets excluded from clinical trials that you'll meet people that it doesn't feel like it should be an exclusion anymore. The 62-year-old that had a bout of atrial fibrillation that got an ablation that's not taking any anticoagulant or beta blocker and is mountain biking four times a week. It's kind of like... We're going to exclude them there, right? The person that had some kind of chest pain and they had one vessel coronary artery disease, they put a stent in, it's been a number of years, and they can exercise better than they ever could before the stent put in. It's hard to like just universally exclude all of these persons, but that's what they have done in, in clinical trials so far. I think that to your point, like, like what is a life-threatening illness? In trials, they've defined it as something that's progressive, so it's getting worse or it's predicted to get worse in the near future, but it's not yet terminal, which is usually defined as a prognosis of less than six months left to left to live. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe life-threatening conditions. And really coming up for a criteria of what a life-threatening condition is or what a criteria for a complex medical condition is, I mean... You have persons with type 2 diabetes that are not on hypoglycemic types of agents. They're not taking insulin. It's a lifestyle illness. They're in their mid-40s. They just got pro prescribed metformin. Maybe a psilocybin experience could really set them on a different lifestyle path that avoids a lot of really severe complications in the future. And it's like a hard run. We should be wanting to give psilocybin to those persons. Maybe there's other persons that have advanced diabetes and they've got active infections and ulcers and other things going on where it's like that actually falls into the category of life-threatening progressive illness at that point. Um, TDIs is one that's, that's I think like a confounder, like they exclude them from all the depression trials, but I can look at clinicaltrials.gov and find trials planned of psilocybin therapy for concussion headache, right? So it's sort of kind of like, all right, like how bad did you hit your head and when, and what are the kind of like sequel A from it, right? I wouldn't think of it as a hard contraindication. This one, spinal cord injury, I have not found an exclusion from, from clinical trials, but I decided to include it in the slide because I did find a case series that was published recently that highlighted that persons with hemiplegia, paraplegia, quadriplegia, tetraplegia, types of paralysis from spinal cord injuries often have atypical responses to classic psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD that seem consistent with either serotonin toxicity or just a horribly unpleasant muscle spastic experience that lasts a number of, of hours. They haven't really had worsen neurologic outcomes and things like that yet, but, but it's kind of like become higher on my watch list for, I would say just uh, illnesses that affect the nervous systems generally, central nervous system, spinal cord, peripheral nervous system, whether that's because, you know, trauma or physical damage to that area, or whether it's because some other type of autoimmune or neurologic kind of condition, like advanced multiple sclerosis, I might start like putting in that category of maybe they're going to have atypical responses to mushrooms and we don't have very much data about it. As far as metabolism of psilocybin and psilocin, there's probably a little bit more to find out, but so far it seems pretty clean from a pharmacokinetic drug interaction kind of perspective. There's a lot of drugs that are metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver or CYP enzymes, CYP enzymes. It seems like that's a pretty minor part of psilocin's metabolism. It seems mostly phase two glucuronidation. It's like adding a sugar molecule makes it more water soluble so the kidney can, it, can excrete it. And there's a whole lot less drug-drug interactions that go, go on through the phase two metabolism or glucuronal transferase system. I did have a colleague, Kellen Thomas, that reported he was at a poster session last year and then saw at least one poster suggesting 
that's also metabolism was sensitive to CYP2D6 genetic status, but I've not seen anything that's actually published in medical literature. That's why I kind of say like, well, limited potential for CYP enzyme interactions discovered to date, because there could be a little bit more there. But you're also sort of thinking with pharmacokinetic interactions that it's usually chronic use in drugs that have serious toxicities of the highest risk because they can accumulate in the body over time. And then all of a sudden it's super therapeutic and causing a problem. Whereas if you're kind of thinking a one-time administration of something at a center, it's like, well, yeah, if you had a real problem eliminating or metabolizing the drug, you might get higher for a little bit longer. But with a drug that has a physical safety margin like psilocybin, I'm not sure that that's the most massive concern in the world overall. We do have kinetic data supporting its safety and at least mild to moderate levels of renal impairment. And I might actually like color the liver diseases a little bit more too. Like, is it cirrhosis you're talking about where there's actually fibrotic liver tissue? You know, if someone had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and LFTs one and a half times the upper limit of normal, is that a liver disease where they can't use it anymore? I, that kind of falls into lifestyle illness could probably benefit a lot from psilocybin to me, but I get the point that there are probably a line with liver illness, ascites, jaundice, things like that, where the risks probably really do go up. This is psilocin at serotonin 2A synapses, not that psilocin doesn't act at other types of targets in the body, but it does seem fairly specific for the serotonin nervous system and fairly specific for serotonin receptors. And the parts that I really like to point out is that it binds directly to serotonin receptors, but compared to serotonin, it only produces a partial physiologic response. This is probably why there is no lethally defined dose of psilocybin mushrooms, because it produces a full response here. You would think that at some point you would run into serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity. The other piece of that is psilocin is an unable to increase intrasynaptic serotonin. It doesn't release serotonin. It doesn't block serotonin reuptake. It doesn't block monamine oxidase. So there's really no physiologic way that we know of that psilocybin or psilocin increases intrasynaptic serotonin, which is another key feature of drugs that actually cause serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity. Um, Kind of thinking now, okay, what other drugs act at the synapse that are psychotropic types of medications, right? So you've got things like SGA, second generation antipsychotics or atypical antipsychotics. There's a few, I would say, antidepressants turned hypnotics, like antidepressants turned sleep aids, things like mirtazapine, remeron, trazodone, or desferil that also probably block the serotonin to a receptor at fairly low doses. Something like MDMA releases serotonin. All your SSRIs, SNRIs, the SRI part, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor, this cert here is the serotonin reuptake pump, so that is their target. TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants would also bind that kind of a target. So some of these things are indirect, like an SSRI binding this and psilocybin binding there. Uh, it's probably not the strongest or most contraindicated type of drug drug interaction in the world. And all those SSRIs are used for illnesses that seems like psychedelics can benefit, whereas things like the second generation antipsychotics, well, they directly block the effects of psilocybin and they're usually used for psychotic conditions, severe bipolar conditions, or other types of refractory psychiatric conditions. So you're kind of thinking that those ones could be a higher risk or much more in that really contraindicated zone or really higher risk zone versus some of these other things like... Uh, I don't know, Prozac or an SSRI. So what do we know here? Lithium is the one that seems to be, we know it's toxic with psilocybin. The good news there is that lithium is a total oddball. It's a chemical element on the periodic table. So it's unlikely that there are going to be other drugs that have similar actions uh, to, to, to lithium with serotonin-based uh, psychedelics. And I think that's really the only one that Oregon's program says, like you don't mix with psilocybin. Uh, things like the SSRIs, they appear non-toxic. It doesn't seem like there's much risk of serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity. Some people get preserved benefits and get a lot out of psilocybin mushrooms still. Some people, it seems to really diminish effects to the point where it could potentially be a total dud or they may need a higher dose to kind of achieve the, the, the effect that they want. 
MAOIs are interesting. Seems like if you're on a chronic use of MAOI, like the irreversible ones, like phenylzine, trinylcypermine, isocarboxazid, then it actually diminishes responses to psychedelics like psilocybin, probably through a postsynaptic receptor downregulation mechanism akin to maybe an SSRI. Whereas if you're acutely using particularly reversible MAOIs like the harmal alkaloids and ayahuasca, it potentiates responses to, to psilocybin. The atypical antipsychotics, you saw the diagram on the previous slide, these are usually indicated as mood stabilizers or for psychosis. They appear non-toxic, but they greatly diminish the effects of psilocybin, and they're usually used in persons with refractory or potentially contraindicated types of, of illnesses. So uh, I might focus on atypical antipsychotics or, or, or a strong history of being prescribed atypical antipsychotics as some things that may clue you into there could be a higher risk condition or um, or they just might be taking medications that are just not very compatible with, with what they want to do. Typical antipsychotics like Haldol seem like they just, it's like, well, it doesn't, you still trip out, but instead of having mystical ego dissolution, you have anxious dysphoric type of ego dissolution. Haldol has been used in two studies, one with psilocybin and it had this result, one with MDMA had the same sort of result. So Haldol or first generation uh, antipsychotics seem to just make the experience more dysphoric in some way. Boosperone is an anxiolytic type of drug. It binds serotonin 1A or 2A receptors. It appears non-toxic, but there is a pretreatment experiment showing that it diminishes mystical responses to psilocybin by about 50%. Whereas what, what is suspected? Well, benzodiazepines have been used in emergency medicine around psychedelic experiences. You can find all the essential research guidelines that recommend benzodiazepines for things that don't respond to emotional support, agitated, combative, trying to hurt themselves, other people breaking and destroying property, those types of situations. And it's also fairly well documented through different types of anecdote repository sites that benzodiazepines are trip killers. So probably dose and temporally dependent, meaning you, you have large doses right before the experience, it really takes the edge off. You had a small dose three days ago, unlikely to impact things much at all. But those benzodiazepines, if you're at high doses and you stop them abruptly, now you're at risk of having a seizure. Seizures is on a high risk list for things with psilocybin. So you probably don't want situations that can increase risk of seizures too, like heavy alcohol withdrawal or heavy benzodiazepine withdrawal could be things that increase risk of seizures when using psychedelics. Um, other serotonin 2A receptor psychotropics like the trazodone or tazepine, I say like uh, vasoconstrictive agents like tryptan migraine medications, it seems like the trials they have planned say to avoid those for a good 12 to 24 hours before or after psilocybin. Stimulants, things like amphetamines, probably not huge drug interaction risks overall, but may increase cardiovascular risk. Depending on the dose, they may increase risk of like just adverse uh, psychiatric events too. Like for example, um, the kind of binge model of amphetamine, very reliable as far as drug-induced psychosis. Mm, psychedelics also used in animal research as models of drug-induced psychosis. So maybe adding these two things together, particularly at higher sorts of doses, maybe that does increase some sort of uh, risk of psychiatric sequelae. Well, butrin or bupropion is unlikely to diminish responses to psilocybin. That one I consider more or less compatible with psilocybin. I would say use of ketamine can intensify psychological or cardiovascular effects and risks. I've not seen any data mixing psilocybin with ketamine, but I know enough facilitators that like to stack things and they all say the same stuff. Um, decreased metabolism. So yeah, these glucuronal transferase enzymes, there are a few drugs out there or maybe alkaline phosphatase, like converting psilocybin to psilocin. Like there are a few dr drugs out there that can have effects there. There's no actual form of clinical data, but you may suspect there are pharmacokinetic interactions with those agents. And then I think just as a, as a final thing here, or maybe it's something, I don't know what the rule is around it, right? But I think once you get people that are using several medications, they're using medications at higher doses, particularly serotonin-based psychotropics, controlled substances, or just other strong psychoactive types of things, 
then the chances of higher risks or unpredictable responses and drug interactions seems to go up. Like you can find observational data that just the number of psychotropic agents you're prescribed is associated with your risk of having a seizure. Like it, and it doesn't seem to even matter which ones. It's kind of like you mix a bunch of chemicals together in a person's head and unpredictable things can start occurring sometimes. And given the level of puritanical avoidance of different drugs and clinical trials to date, it's kind of a black box when you get someone with four different psychiatric drugs that's approaching this. So clear as mud, 50 shades of gray. Some psych so some, uh, you know, some psychotropics really can diminish effects, but Hey, if it's diminishing the effects by 10 or 15% and they can get 85 to 90% of the benefit, God, I would be willing to do that. Whereas if it was an 80% decrease in effect, then it sounds like a waste of everyone's time and money and a huge disappointment to everybody. And maybe even acute loss of hope can be a risk for persons that do have severe depression. Um, you know, if it's dangerous, well, yeah, it's dangerous. Just don't take that kind of risk. I think I'm just going to stop here because I want to open up for questions. And I have a feeling I was already longer than 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Valcom. This has been really incredible, really helpful. Um, and I learned a lot. And so I really appreciate that. Um, so just a couple of kind of clarification. And so, you know, the, the goal is to regulate less, right? And so the yeah. hope is not to actually exclude anyone yeah. per regulation. It's more identifying who needs to be um, consulting with someone who yeah. knows a lot about these conditions, whether it's the psychiatric yeah. Yeah. or the medical, if that makes sense. So what I'm hearing is based on that list we had up earlier, things we might need to consider adding is, is folks on certain medications for sure, maybe more clarity around the diseases, life-threatening diseases, things like that. Other thoughts on that list? And we can probably bring it back up again. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, I think the list you have is fairly good. It's like fairly consistent with the with the slide deck. And yeah, it's like the slides that I have. It's not meant to. Okay, we got to codify all of this into rules that exclude persons. I think it's more like I, I like um, I thought I was presenting around drug interactions for like training programs, right? And so it's like I think that having some level of training for facilitators where there is just a basic awareness of okay, SSRIs. That's not a deal breaker, not to exclude persons, but I would think for the person approaching the natural medicine, even like if I was on an SSRI and that could change my experience some way, or there was some data showing a diminished effects, it would just be like, well, that person should have that information going into the experience. So I think a lot of the stuff for the 50 shades of gray, where it's not kind of like, okay, that's the absolute highest risk scenario that we can think of where, okay, maybe there was a few things that are contraindicated. I think everything else becomes the... Well, that's why we educate. Like that's why we counsel. That's why we have those things as part of the training programs. And you know, maybe there's. I expect this information to evolve. To to be honest, like I expect us to get a lot more data about this. So, of course, so I think like yeah, part of it is like just for training. Like I want, like I would want persons to have this kind of awareness. I guess yeah. But there are groups of people that need some consultation to come up with a treatment plan if they're going to use psilocybin. So I'm hearing the things that I don't have, that we don't have on that list right now, lithium, antipsychotics, but maybe all psychotropic medications where you would need some consultation. I mean, there are definitely some where I'm kind of like, okay, you take a little bit of gabapentin, go ahead, okay. right? <laughs> There's definitely a, a few out there, right, with one medication. But is that just... But I mean, I guess, I, and you may not be able to answer that. Is that a decision that a, someone at the wellness level could make, or is that a decision that needs to have consultation from someone who can treat and diagnose? Well, I think this is it, right? And I think like, like, like I can find, maybe I'll share with a group, but I can find one article from a forensic psychiatrist that talks about the perilous policies of Oregon psilocybin law. And basically saying like, you're putting people that do not have clinical licensures at the position of making a clinical decision about whether to seek clinical help. And it's kind of like, this is a forensic psychiatrist dream come true. Cause you're just by law forcing people that don't have that scope of practice to, to go outside of it. And I don't know what the answers are. Right. But I read this article and was kind of like, yeah. And you know, it's, well, and that's it's part that, of the reason uh, we've kind of settled on this scope of, you know, these 
these kind of um, spheres of practice and, and, you know, wanting to not exclude people that are actually seeking treatment, but trying to make that in a safe way for both the participant, but also for the facilitator. I want to, and we talked about this a lot last Mm -hmm. time is I think it opens up facilitators to risk. What what about like, are you, so the, 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 the screening, for example, are you guys going to have like a standardized screening form for the entire state for the facilitators, right? I think that is, you know, the goal. So, so if it were me, I would sort of be trying to take the decisions out of it for the facilitator and build the decision-making roles into the intake form. Mm -hmm. Oh, you check this answer. That means that you should have some kind of consultation service instead of, okay, here's your intake form. How the facility look at it and use their subjective judgment to figure out whether they should have some other consult. Like, I, I think it would be a, it would protect the facilitators at least to kind of have an algorithm built into the intake form that suggests to get a consult rather than it's up to them to decide based on what the information they're reading. It would be great if you could submit that screening form that you have. We can't look at, you know, like it needs to go through. Um, yeah, yeah. And then that would be amazing. Um, Mr. Wynn, I'm going to see because I've talked enough. Thank you so much, Dr. Hammond. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm. Um, two quick things. One is, um, I just wanted to kind of confirm my understanding and make a comment that in the clinical trials that you looked at and, and you know, from which you drew this information about contraindications, is it true that the majority of them or maybe all of them, um, those settings were under the supervision of somebody with a license to practice psychotherapy or some other clinically oriented um, you know, uh, profession beyond uh, psychedelic facilitation? Yeah, I believe that's the case. Okay, so I guess I just want to say that that standard, um, our standard that's in our draft recommendation, is is far, far more inclusive than the standard in those clinical trials where they're outright excluding people, even if they can get the care from somebody, you know, at least with, with regard to the mental illness, is, is, is qualified to care for those conditions. Whereas we're saying you can get the care, you just for your own safety's sake need to get it under the care of somebody who is qualified to care for the condition that you have. So that's just a comment that I wanted to share. Mm-hmm. The other one is with regard to the uh, for some reason, I have this like peak about these cardiovascular conditions. I read your list to um, be more specific and, and to, to identify conditions that were a little more severe than just every cardiac condition. For example, I don't yeah. think I saw uh, high cholesterol. I didn't see hypertension. I saw, you know, right. controlled hypertension. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good Anderson, point. Like, like, I think for like Dr. Like when I read that list and it said cardiovascular risk factors, I'm like, well, the strongest cardiovascular risk factor is age. Right, like, and then it's high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and whether you smoke and how much exercise you have, and the process. Like that's what I think about with cardiovascular risk factors. Whereas the 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 list is more like these are real conditions. It's not a risk factor anymore if you've had an arrhythmia, or if you've had a stroke, or that you know that you're beyond the the risk factors, right? So I do think like holistically looking at risk factors sometimes can be helpful, but I would probably focus more on like okay, you're 75 years old, oh, that's high risk. Or is it? I, I don't know. Like, or is age nothing but a number, you know? So in some ways looking at risk factors is helpful, but I think if you're trying to be inclusive and permitting, I would focus on real conditions that have happened or events. Right. Yeah. I appreciate that feedback. And I, I got to Mr. Wynn. I, I think I, uh, I, it makes sense to change the language there. I mean, I think part of what I was getting at last time is, I don't know that I am not a medical doctor. I don't feel comfortable judging the risk of somebody else's cardiovascular risk factors because I don't do that for a living. Like what there's, you know, in terms of a cardi- cardi- cardiovascular condition saying like, we will allow some conditions and not others. I, that feels dicey to me um, as someone who doesn't have a medical training, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it makes sense to change the language to cardiovascular conditions. Um, Ms. Gail? Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm. Um, so I just want to, I have my hand up and then you kind of, uh, said this already, but I just want to second this, a comment about training and the need for training. Um, I think that, oh, so I have referred many people over the years to, uh, Dr. Malcolm's work. Um, it's very specialized what you're talking about regarding the shades of gray and the complexities and nuances of this and the reality that some of the exclusion criteria, the contraindicated medications 
in clinical trials um, are very conservative, don't always take into account these real world factors and are often more related to confounding variables than to actual risk. Um, and I know that that presentation that you just did would have, you can present on that for a full day or probably a few days, and that this is a lot of specialized information. And I just want to second and put a flag in this. I know that we're talking right now about a specific document, but really to put a flag in this regarding um, training. And this isn't something that doctors know. This isn't something that psychiatrists know. I refer a lot of people to um, Dr. Malcolm because it's a very specialized area. And I just want to, um, I know we'll come back around to this, but I just want to emphasize that. I wholeheart I mean, I think we all hope wholeheartedly agree. And that's why, you know, in this in this year model, we've said that any medical pro provider or mental health provider that wants to get involved in this this area needs to also get a facilitator license. It, it's not just enough to be a medical provider or a mental health provider and, and say, okay, now I can provide this consultation. Um in, in you know, in the model, they do have to go through the education piece, if that makes sense. I think what I'm referring to is education, like specifically that presentation that we just got, like a, a training, training on that. Yeah, that, yes. yeah that, that is built into the training. Yes. Your Thank you so much. With Prell, Mr. Prell. So I just want to point out, as someone who's facilitated dozens and dozens of ceremonies, I've always carried benzos on me as a backup, just in case there is a bad experience or somebody actually, I've had one time where somebody actually wanted to take away consent and I brought them out of the trip with that. My question to you is because as facilitators, licensed facilitators in the spirit one, we won't be able to have access to any of that stuff. What would are there natural alternatives that can help bring people out of a trip and other things that could interact with the actual plant medicine that we are ministering to people? That way we can make people aware of it before their facilitation session that they need to stop taking this vitamin, this supplement, so that way they can get the full experience. Or if they are having that experience that they don't like, we can bring them out of that in that case. Yeah, I don't. Well, first of all, I do know of people that administer basically a Russian research chemical that used called Fenibut instead of benzodiazepines. And I believe that you can purchase that without a prescription, but I would not recommend or suggest it. I think going with the benzodiazepines is much better. And unfortunately, there's really not very much out there that's demonstrated to be able to take a person out of a trip, except for maybe a benzodiazepine or, or an atypical antipsychotic, which sounds worse than using a benzodiazepine, really. Um, it's a good question, because when I think of psychedelic emergencies beyond this kind of like, oh, it's unpleasant, I want it to stop, I'm kind of thinking, yeah, like the agitation and combative, like, Maybe they don't want it to stop, but we have to do something, right? Because they're they hurting themselves. Thinking about, okay, like how many staff do we have on hand? Okay, the, the licensed facilitator is a 105 pound she, her, and the person that they're sitting with is a 280 pound EN. Like, Wow, like like if, if this person trauma comes up and they relive combat trauma or the time that they were arrested against their will or things like that, then how will we manage that situation? Right. So thinking about the number of staff or participants and if you do need emergency medications on hand or there's some kind of psychedelic emergency kit. Right, because I'm thinking wand thermometers that screens hyperthermia. That's a quick way of understanding: are we in the serotonin toxicity zone or not? If a seizure occurs, a benzodiazepine. Agitation occurs, benzodiazepine. Serotonin toxicity occurs, benzodiazepine. Right, like 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 it seems to help a lot of different, really serious types of psychedelic emergencies. Those last ones: serotonin toxicity, agitation, seizures. I mean, we might be in the realm of intramuscular benzodiazepine or rectal for seizure, maybe, um, probably can't administer oral even at that point. I don't know what the answer is to your question, but it's a very good question. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, and then as far as like the supplements go, oh man, 
it's, it's I, I usually it's kind of like, hey, what will happen to you if you take a break from those supplements for a few days? And very few people say, I will go into withdrawal. It will be difficult for me. And it's like, okay, from the angle of chemical reverence and not really understanding what the supplement regimen does overall, let's just take a short break from it. You know, the ones that are like, okay, vitamin, minerals, things like that, not, not too concerned with overall, but the sort of like neurohacker stack things that have racetams in it, you know, things that have, I would say like supplement code word for psychiatric conditions. It's mood elevating, it's stress reducing, it's weight and appetite regulating, right? I mean, these are supplement code words for treats anxiety, treats depression, has stimulants that cause anorectic weight loss effects in them, right? So I don't have like the list, right? St. John's wort would kind of be up there because it's serotonergic and it does have some risk. Lithium orate, okay, they're five to 20 milligrams over the counter. That's orders of magnitude less usually than lithium carbonate for a bipolar condition. But I've found people that take massive doses of over the counter lithium orate. Um, good questions, Luke. <laughs> Yeah. Not sure what the what the answers are, but the, the lithium the supplement regimens are exhaustive. Would the lithium orate actually put them at a higher risk of a seizure? You wouldn't think so, not at five to twenty milligrams, because it seems like if you're a county that has lithium in the drinking water, like five to five to ten milligrams of lithium orate is like three times what's found in drinking water, right? versus lithium carbonate for a bipolar condition, now you're a hundred X times higher or more than drinking water. So, okay, where's the line then though? 50 milligrams of lithium orotate, a hundred milligrams of lithium orotate? Like no one knows where the line is, I guess. And so maybe you got a lithium supplement. And this dose is so low that you probably don't have a risk of having a seizure, but can you take 72 hours off of it? Yeah. All right. Just take three spires off of it then. So sometimes just more standardized approaches with lengthy supplement lists, supplement stacks. I would say like Chinese herbs is another one that is difficult for me to evaluate because there's oftentimes multiple, multiple ingredients that don't have very much information about. I uh, want to say first, Dr. Malcolm, thank you. It's a very enlightening presentation. Just heard Gail's claim. I'm pretty familiar with this work and I learned things today. So even an experienced psychedelic psychiatrist um, doesn't have all the information someone like you has, which goes to training. Um, but I wanted to make a couple quick comments. One, um, to your question about safety. You know, with the 280 pound, you know, let's say veteran, um, maybe a female therapist or even a male therapist who, you know, where there could be a safety. I think that's a training issue. Um, it's something that we've had to address in Oregon with our center there. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I think when you start, it's interesting when you start going over the line into a thermometer or uh, a blood pressure cough, um, suddenly you're out of the scope again, as you pointed out before. So we have to keep be mindful of that as well. Very good points. Thank you. Other questions for Dr. Malcolm? So Dr. Malcolm, I don't know if you have the time to stay on with us, but to Sarah Gill's points and others, like it would be very helpful for you to look at our training uh, modules and, and maybe give feedback on, there is a training module about um, these issues, but maybe give us feedback about things we probably should be concluding if, if you're able. I plan on staying in the meeting and kind of being a fly on the wall. I might kind of step out or, but I'll try to, I'll try to keep my headphones on and listen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. So with that, um, we are going to move back onto the agenda to agenda item three. Um, but I am aware of the time and I would like to take the opportunity to take a short um, break just to give us a little bit of a breather. Um, this has been a really fruitful discussion and I really appreciate it. Um, so the time right now is 2.26. Um, I'd like to take a 10 minute break. So the board will take a short break. Please ensure all cameras are turned off and everyone is muted during the break. This meeting will resume at 2.36. Thank you.
Okay, hey, I'd like to bring us back um, for this second half of the meeting. We're going to start with agenda. I, well, before I say this, um, just a follow-up on the scopes of practice, that is still a draft form. We're gonna be presenting it tomorrow in their full board meeting with um, some of the suggestions from today and, and um, some of the, the work of Dr. Malcolm and, and maybe adding some additional things. But we'll be continuing to discuss that in future meetings um, and more drafts of that will be available. Um, for our next item, agenda item number three, we're, we're going to have a presentation from the Healing Advocacy Fund on, on training program discussion group analysis. So we're going to have Ms. Poisset and Mr. Keppel um, from the fund presenting their work, <clears throat> looking at um, discussions and, and analysis from facilitators in Oregon and Colorado regard, regarding training program education. So we're going to hold all um, questions t until after this presentation, if that's okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanna, um, and thanks for having us on today. Uh, just wanted to really quickly say uh, that we've been following the board's process really closely and just so appreciative of all of you and the hard work you're putting into this. I think it's an incredible group of folks on here um, and the state of Colorado really uh, owes a lot to all of you for how much dedication you bring. So I wanted to share that. Um, all right. So uh, as I mentioned in my intro, uh, the Healing Advocacy Fund is working to support implementation of 
Proposition 122. And we decided to undertake this process of, um, I'm wondering if it would make sense for me to share so I can scroll through, or is that kind of outside of the... Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Early. Um, so since you all were starting to dive into these considerations around the training program requirements, and uh, we have half of our team in Oregon working really closely with the state program there, uh, we thought it may make sense to just expand a little bit the perspectives included in this conversation and specifically uh, bring in perspectives from people who have actually gone through Oregon training programs, uh, getting their kind of initial feedback on that experience as they start to directly facilitate in the context of this state access program, as well as the training pro so several of the training program operators there in Oregon. Um, and then we spoke with a handful of training programs here in Colorado. And then finally, uh, some legacy practitioners and uh, folks with indigenous lineage uh, and knowledge of indigenous practices as well. Um, and we did keep the conversations that we had anonymous because we wanted to make sure that people felt free to just really share their honest opinion and especially recognizing that we did include the legacy facilitators, so kind of respecting the anonymity there. Um, and ended up speaking with a total of 24 people across these discussions, both in one-on-one -on -one interviews and uh, group discussions. And so this report is really synthesizing some of the key core themes that emerged in those conversations. And I would say um, big picture, what we found is there was actually a lot of consistency across uh, those different backgrounds, which is really interesting to see. So the core themes section of the document, um, which is a little further down, gets into some of those themes that arose and pulls out quotes from the conversation. Um, and really trying to focus on kind of where where are their commonalities that I think we can look to as we think about what's really important in um, a strong training program. And um, so for rolling back up, that is just to give a sense of the methodology and happy to answer questions as well a little later. Um, but I think we'll start by just kind of jumping into what we identified as the key findings from this process. And again, recognizing that this is a compilation of these 24 individuals' perspectives, it is more of a qualitative analysis approach. So it's not you know, meant to be representative, but hopefully um, give ideas for consideration. Um, so one of the major things we wanted to emphasize is that there was this strong feeling that the facilitator's skill and competency is really integral to participant safety. And it is incumbent on us to craft a uh, training program or minimum requirements that reflect the depth of skill required. Um, and kind of with that, the sense that not necessarily everyone can or should be doing this work, that it needs to be taken really seriously. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but I think some of the pieces that come with that are potentially considering increasing um, the hours of training and going a little bit deeper in, in certain areas. Um, there was also a fairly strong consensus that it would be preferable to have uh, maybe two or more, I think the focus was on potentially two sets of training requirements that vary based on past training, training and experience. And I know from having listened to the conversations here that that's not really the direction that the board is looking at going. Um, but I think the reasons that were given for that is um, there's this sense that you want to have a minimum foundation for everyone um, it, because the facilitator uh, training is so core to safety. But so there's this upward pressure on the foundation, but you can't end up in a situation where some of the training elements feel a little bit uh, repetitive for licensed clinicians. And one thing that was pointed out is that um, we really do want to encourage uh, people with experience, both legacy practitioners and licensed clinicians to get licensed, partially so that we have a really strong pool of people to actually serve uh, in a supervisor capacity for this practicum and experiential component. Um, so those are just a couple of things to consider. And um, again, we go into more detail later in the body of the report. Um, I would say the, the, the finding that was most consistent across the board was this very strong belief that personal experience with psilocybin 
mushrooms is essential to doing this work. And um, it was emphasized ideally at varying doses and over a period of time that allows for adequate integration and um, examination of what comes up during those experiences as well. Uh, again, I recognize that um, there's not necessarily the ability to regulate that as a requirement, um, but just capturing here that it, it was viewed as really key kind of across the board. Yes. Um, and then I would say kind of second to that, there's a pretty strong feeling that the practicum component should be substantially built up relative to what was included in Oregon. And um, partially coming back to this sense that uh, there's really no way to fully learn this work without doing it and kind of speaking to some of the specifics that come with working with people in altered states and the types of challenging situations that can arise. Um, so one idea is to just increase the number of practicum hours, but we also heard kind of a range of other ideas um, that might get at some of the, the access issues that that potentially creates or the equity challenges that that could create. Um, such as maybe after having the practicum, having an associate's license that requires kind of continued super supervision in some capacity, but that person could actually be earning an income for those hours versus paying for them in the kind of practicum form format. Um, and kind of along those similar lines, somehow requiring ongoing consultation or regular check-ins um, so that there's this idea that once the practicum ends, that experiential learning comp component doesn't necessarily end and extending that out a little bit farther so that people who really do come with limited training and or experience um, are engaging in this continuing education uh, process. And then a couple other ideas along those lines are um, requiring participation in a facilitator peer support group, um, getting at sort of ref uh, self-reflection, processing things that are coming up, and having that relational learning aspect. Um, and then finally, I think that um, this has been touched on in the conversations, but having robust continuing education requirements as well. Um, and then there's this idea that direct experience with mushrooms um, can and should be supplemented with additional avenues for self-exploration and growth. Um, some of the ones that were considered are somatic work, meditation and mindfulness, again, peer reflection. Um, and those modalities aren't really emphasized in the Oregon requirements, but a lot of the folks we talked with think they're really necessary to foster this kind of self-awareness and presence and nervous system capacity that are really key to being able to actually safely hold space during challenging experiences. And one that's not on the list here, but that was um, also emphasized was philotropic breath work. And I think actually em emphasized as an alternative in specific scenarios where people really aren't able to partake directly um, in a psilocybin mushroom experience. Um, that kind of being one of the closest ways to get to something similar. Um, so looking a little bit at the training, training program structure, um, there's a sense that there should be a requirement for a lot of interactive learning, um, possibly reducing the number of asynchronous hours allowed. And what that really came down to was the sense that in some cases, um, the training programs could be a lot of uh, asynchronous video recordings that, and maybe with experts but without the opportunity to actually engage in conversation and ask questions directly of people that have experience doing this work, um, which can ulti ultimately be pretty limiting in, in, ten in terms of sort of the depth of engagement and, and developing um, not just the knowledge, but actually the skills and awareness and capacities as well. Um, and again, somewhat in line in that, with that, um, a lot of the program graduates said that they would have preferred to have more time spent on directly developing the skills and capacities needed to do the work uh, versus learning conceptual information. And um, I think I'll touch a little bit below on, on what some of that might mean. Uh, but for instance, not just learning a list of contraindications, but actually practicing what an intake might feel like, um, actually doing role play to um, better understand what types of challenging scenarios might come up. And I think one thing that's really important to mention here is that 
as clients are starting to go through the the program in Oregon, we've now probably had um, in the realm of 500 clients go through. And um, we are seeing that it's a pretty high, um, there's a high rate of people with diagnoses and that are on medication. Um, so a lot of the facilitators, especially those without a mental health background, are in the situation where they are working with people um, that may have specific vulnerabilities and would like to have had more experience of what it's actually like to have a conversation with somebody who is in that situation, who's looking to this. Um, may have tried a bunch of other options that didn't work for them and kind of the extent of the emotional intensity that can be part of that process. Um, so that's just kind of one example to illustrate. But again, in the body of the report goes into a little bit more detail of what some of those areas are that could be built out relative to the Oregon requirements. Um, and then we've already touched on this a fair amount in the call already. But in terms of the curriculum area, it's uh, itself. Um, I think the two areas that were most strongly emphasized were going deeper on both trauma and suicidality. Um, trauma specifically was highlighted as really key because I heard an estimate that, you know, when issues do come up in maybe 90, 95% of cases where you have a really challenging episode, it is linked to trauma. Um, and there's also this piece, at, as we've touched on, that there can be repressed trauma. It might not you know, be known going into the session that that's a possibility. So you're not going to control for that entirely by screening. Um, so I think deepening the scope of training in trauma, even for people who are not licensed clinicians, so that they have that foundation to be prepared for that possibility um, is really key. And then um, similarly, suicidality, uh, and then additional hours as well on touch and um, ethical touch. Um, with that, a recommendation to increase the time spent on ethics overall and be able to go deeper there within the training requirements. Um, we had one recommendation that was about 20% of total didactic hours should be focused on ethics. Um, and then th this next one is really in keeping with the presentation we just had. More time should be spent on screening and again, not just memorizing a list, but also practicing directly, um, developing those skills of empathetic listening while setting boundaries, knowing how to say no to somebody who might be very, uh, and say no and, and, you know, and offer referral to somebody who might be very desperate and is hearing a lot of promise and, and recognizing kind of the messaging that is out there around this and how much stake people are putting into it. Um, uh, another request was additional information, in, um, which is that um, the adverse events that you know are starting to develop do seem to be linked to some of the really high doses. Um, so additional focus and guidance on that. Um, and then I guess this is the this is the point that I made that initial reports we're seeing um, that they're there are folks with diagnoses and on sometimes multiple different forms of medication. Um, so creating resources for people to be able to navigate that and emphasizing the training, which I think you guys already have a really clear focus on. Um, and then I think just as a final point, um, within the training, really illustrating and um, developing and understanding that although some of these challenging situations might be rare that can come up, um, they do occur. And so in the facilities, facilitator's capacity to respond can be the determining factor and outcome for the participant. So really just keeping that in mind as we're thinking about what is the base foundation here that's needed across the board. Um, so those are the key findings. And then I just want to, I don't want to spend too much time in the body of the report before giving a chance for questions, but I'll just kind of walk you through what's here and um, you guys hopefully can have this as a resource going forward. Um, so a lot of tensions and trade-offs to consider when it comes to equity and access and potentially lifting up these minimum uh, training standards. And I think, you know, one of the interesting thoughts that came out of the conversation for me was that, yes, if you increase the minimum hours, it is going to potentially reduce access. I think, of course, we all want to think about how we can do this cre like, creatively and what avenues there are. Um, but there's this sense that equity shouldn't be on the back of lowering the bar for training um, because that can really do a disservice to the participants, but also to the facilitators. Because if you end up, you know, 
investing in a training program, thinking you're prepared for something and then going out there and seeing what the reality is um, and, and maybe feeling like you don't have adequate training or capacity, that's also not really a fair situation to be in. Um, so I think keeping that in mind um, is important. And there's a lot more here. I'm not going to get into all of this. So I'll leave it for you guys to peruse on your own time in terms of the tensions and trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Thematic analysis. Um, again, I think a lot of this is really going to echo what I just walked through with the key findings. Um, I guess what I would point out is if you want to peruse these quotes, I think some of them really bring to life some of those considerations. As you can see, you get a little bit deeper on the ethics and, and some of the pieces that are emphasized is really important here. Um, this, this idea around having the capacity for presence and self-regulatory skills was really emphasized as a core capacity of a facilitator um, that can be developed and might require kind of specific modalities to develop that go outside of learning information. Um, so how do we craft a set of requirements that really reflect that? Um, and, and this emphasis that, you know, it's one thing to be present and attentive for a one hour, two hour session. It's another thing to be present, attentive, compassionately aware for six to eight hours at a time, multiple days a week, over and over again for weeks on end. And so that just developing that capacity in and of itself is a really serious undertaking um, for people who do want to be doing this more and kind of their full kind. Emphasis on the importance of self-reflection, self-awareness, personal development and growth on the part of the facilitator. And I think going with this, there's actually one other flag that was raised um, that I think is worth em emphasizing, which is actually the role of training programs and kind of vetting who goes through the training in the first place. And that there, you know, was emphasized that there are some people who might not themselves be in a place to, to have that capacity for others experiencing and processing their trauma um, because of their own mental health situation or their own um, current experience of trauma. So identifying when somebody might need to take a little bit more time and come back um, to this versus investing a bunch of time and money in training. And then again, realizing that like it's it's not um, really a safe fit for where they're at in their lives. Um, so yes, that piece of kind of vetting. Um, and there was tied to that this kind of suggestion around actually including interviews in the process of, of um, selecting people to participate in the training programs um, to get more of that kind of interactive relational element and understanding of people. Um, some also include uh, like clinical evaluations and other um, approaches to, to get at that piece. So yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of these already. Um, balancing scientific and traditional ways of knowing and practicing. Um, there's a general support for your sphered approach and thinking that that does, you know, a better job than uh, uh, what they have in Oregon and recognizing um, the different potential issues that can come up. Um, Role play is an important tool in teaching and learning. Again, that ex experiential piece and actually developing those skills, um, trusting the process and the inner healing capacity of participants. Um, so I think I'll, there's there's a fair amount more here. So I'm gonna um, move on to the next couple sections. Um, overall, again, the recommendation is probably to increase both didactic and experiential hours with an emphasis really on the experiential piece. Um, this section walks through a little bit more granular and specific recommendations around some of those um, suggestions. So verbal and uh, nonverbal and verbal de-escalation, understanding sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, identifying fight or flight response, identifying when somebody might be dissociating, um, also thinking about how dissociation can uh, relate to dosing and the possibility that somebody might be given a, a progressively higher dose, but they're actually um, in a trauma response and uh, educating trainees around the possibility of that. Robert. And then I thought this quote was um, kind of important to, to 
highlight. Uh, I had a man totally superimpose his fear of witches on me. He thought I was a witch casting an evil spell. I dug deep into my trauma training and pulled out the skills I've learned. And that actually came from somebody who does not have a clinical background, who um, is has been working as a as, as a facilitator, but does have extensive training that they sought out specific to trauma. And so I think it, and, and then also has sought out training um, in indigenous contexts and a kind of across a range of different areas. And I think it highlights that it's not necessarily that somebody needs specifically a cl clinical background to be prepared, but everybody across the board should have this emphasis on um, learning the basics of trauma. Um, so yeah, I'll leave these for your perusal and of course questions if we wanna jump in later. Um, in terms of what to reduce, there wasn't a whole lot, um, sorry, uh, but there was this sense that, again, some of the more theoretical or abstract pieces could be reduced or at, less, at least de-emphasized relative to these more kind of direct applicable skills. Um, so when it comes to pharmacology, not necessarily requiring everyone to go super deep into the different receptors and how all of this um, functions, but really what do we need to know to work with people to identify potential contraindications? Um, what is most applicable to my work as a facilitator um, and, and really focusing on that as the priority? Uh, there was some sense that some of the kind of bigger picture training around health systems and health equity could be repetitive for people, for instance, who already are licensed clinical social workers um, or have a background in, in specific areas. So again, coming back to maybe it is appropriate to have different training requirements um, based on people's prior experience and training. Um, and then here uh, we get into a list of recommendations for structural and programmatic ideas that kind of go beyond the curriculum itself. Um, so again, some of these, uh, we, we, um, divided them up based on kind of the different themes that emerged. And so each section has some ideas of how you could build in some pieces to this program to reflect that theme. Um, if it, you know, is agreed to be an important consideration and not all of these, um, again, are curriculum itself, although some of them are. Um, so this is the, the idea of this associate's license following the practicum. Um, there was also the suggestion that hours volunteering with something like the Zendo project or in a harm reduction capacity could be included in experiential, um, to better allow for kind of that scope of experience and, and, um, dealing with adverse events, um, So yeah, there's a lot here. I think I won't go through them all um, because I want to give time for questions. Uh, um, so yeah, with that, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions or thoughts people have. Thank you so much. This is incredibly helpful and I just really appreciate healing advocacy funding you for, for doing these interviews and coming today to present them. Um, thank you. Yes, Dr. I just want to thank you for your presentation because it was really helpful. This, along with Dr. Malcolm's, is really helping to gel things together and really um, demonstrating as well the indigenous approach to, to what you see. I really liked when you mentioned the opportunity to be able to volunteer and then those quarterly check-ins. I have worked with five indigenous elders, healers, and one of them was in New Mexico and we would have quarterly check-ins and you know you you will ex be exposed to so many different reactions that individuals have and if you have a system set up where you can have those check-ins whether they're monthly quarterly you know it, it puts the facilitator in a space where you're thinking okay I'm going to have to talk to my maestra next quarter you know she's going to be asking me questions about my sessions you know, like, for example, I was doing Olympia, and this is what the person experienced. I was pouring a sweat lodge, and this is what the person experienced. They want to know, what are you doing, and what are your patients or clients experiencing so that you, you're building that the, your clinical skills, 
as well as your awareness and everything else. So I think that that what you're talking about here is really relevant, you know, spending more time screening, for example, in curanderismo and in the indigenous world, we call it a platica, but basically it's a, a, a talk, if you will, a heart-to-heart communication where you're, you're learning all about the individual and you're also spending time with them so that you can recognize if you should be referring them out or if you need to say, this person is going to require more than I'm capable of providing as a professional. And so I think that both this and what we heard earlier, you know, um, I agree that people don't have to learn all about the synapses and all the the science behind it. But some people, you know, uh, part of my degrees were earned just so that I could exist along the medical world. So I have an OT degree. I have my bachelor's of science in integrative medicine, my natural medicine. And I really enjoyed learning the science piece as well to tie it together with the indigenous philosophies. So I think that if we can create something that allows people, you know, even if they're not in the category one and they're not going to be licensed, but if they want to have this education available to them, I think that this is really important because the more people that we have who choose not to be licensed, but have this education available to them, the safer our communities are going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. We appreciate it. Dr. Kumar? Thanks, Dr. Chavez. I really appreciate that. And this points out for your beautiful presentation and gathering all this information. I wanted to emphasize the importance of subtle care during training and um, how that it isn't something that's necessarily incorporated in from what I can tell, um, but it does show up in a lot of different forms, such as the facilitator-led, what I'm going to call supervision groups. I wonder whether um, this points out specifically a question to you. Uh, There was any recommendation for incorporating indigenous knowledge base in the training uh, in order to be able to emphasize energy work. We all know that these um, medications, they open up portals for individuals and our self-knowledge about ourselves is so crucial to the space that we create and the ways in which we interfere and may not even be aware that we're interfering. And maybe a really great way to substitute for the time um, that's redundant health equity by actually having Indigenous presence. Thank thank you. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Dr. Kumar. And actually, yes, I, um, I, I feel like I skipped around a little bit here, so I didn't get to go as deep as I would have liked in some areas. Um, but that piece was definitely emphasized in the conversation, in particular around, you know, uh, developing this compassionate presence and capacity um, as kind of even connected to one of those modalities. So there were mentions of meditation and mindfulness practice, but also bringing in Um, practitioners who do have, uh, as trainers, who have knowledge um, and experience uh, in that, in those traditional contexts. So thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Trump? Hi, thank you. Good to see you again, Tasha. (laughs) Um, There's a couple things that really stood out to me that that I'd like to offer and share. One is... um, um, criterion and training around group work, I think, should be um, uh, more elevated and have um, different factors than in individual work. Um, we think a lot about group coherence in in ceremonia and how to facilitate um, higher levels of group coherence for group safety going into a ceremony. Or a ceremony. The second is um, the way that I think about uh, harm reduction and and betterment is it's a spectrum, right? At the very, let's say, bottom of the spectrum is physical safety and making sure that there are this yes. proper training in um, around that. But there are often areas of safety that I think can be overlooked, uh, particularly that around what I would classify as spiritual safety, right? Which is the permission for the, and the environment for the individual to discover what it is feels true for themselves without the impression of dogma by the facilitator. Um, and you know, in conversation with some, some other folks, um, one of the mechanisms that I found to be maybe one of the best tests of the quality of the facilitator to hold uh, what I consider to be a, a spiritually safe space is to 
um, pose a challenge to that facilitator's beliefs, right? And see how they are able to hold that, whether they get triggered or angry versus um, create space for uh, the individual to come to their own beliefs. So, um, you know, even though I know we're not, we're not here to regulate spirituality, I think it is important to include in, in the training some conversation around um, the, the, the safe space for people to, to bring in their own flavors of spirituality, whatever that might look like. Yeah. Um, then, then I think it really gets, you know, once we kind of overcome, um, you know, this, this safety conversation, um, I think that there are as much to be said about practices for, for bettering the well, right. Or betterment of people. Um, and, and again, I think it's a spectrum because the same practices that go, you know, that enhance safety also enhance betterment. Um, you know, what ceremonia, our primary belief system is, is founded around the individual's inner healing intelligence and, and their, um, inner guidance being able to be with what is right. Leading them to accept everything is okay. And then in that surrender, finding love and compassion, right? We follow the internal family systems model, for example. And so, uh, I, I, I'm very happy that there is so much uh, emphasis on ethics and safety in the training, but I also think that it, there would be significant value in um, certain training and modalities like IFS that can lead people into higher states of self-inquiry that can, that can get beyond just the, the, the safety and into um, this constant mindfulness presence and 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 levels of deepening within oneself. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Austin. Nice to see you again as well. Um, I wanted to note that the first thing you brought up about um, facilitating with groups did absolutely come up. It's it's pretty sparse, or it's a pretty small number of hours in Oregon, and um, people pointed out that the dynamics are really, really different, and um, it requires a little bit more time and consideration. And as for the other pieces, I, I you know, I, I really um, hear you there. And I think that there is, uh, I think, you know, in our questions, we might have focused really on the safety piece because we're thinking about minimum requirements. And so there's this question around what should be regulated as a minimum requirement um, and where can we give room and space for different programs to kind of create their own approaches and bring in some of these different um, modalities. And I think that that's a question that's actually relevant for, throughout even thinking about some of these recommendations is, is what is what is really core and where is there room for um, experimentation and growth. Thank you both. So I'm going to give a time reminder. I want to hear from everybody else who has their hand raised. We also need to move into actually talking about our education requirements. So hoping to, to give this maybe 10 to 15 more minutes. Lundy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I so appreciate community feedback. Uh, and my, my question is primarily around the burden of responsibility on training programs to vet participants, because it's coming from a couple concerns. Um, as a licensed therapist, I've heard of numerous experiences with existing programs of harm experienced through the program itself in educational settings, group settings, um, especially for marginalized groups of people. I, I can personally speak as a trans and queer person about um, peripheral situations I've heard. And so in some of this feedback, I'm noticing that there's this request to put that burden on the state through something like an interview. Um, and I just have significant concern, number one, that we would allow folks to go through whole hundreds of hours long programs for thousands of dollars, potentially, where these participants are getting reoccurring um, relational and professional and academic um, experiences with each other where vetting is inherently more possible than a single interview with the state um, or something, you know, that someone's invested in and then suddenly getting to the state level and there being significant amounts of concern. So I'm curious if there is any community feedback about the burden of responsibility of vetting facilitators by training programs rather than uh, deferring that responsibility to the state. 
Yeah, so I, I don't think, um, thank you for that. I, I don't think I heard or we heard anyone um, highlight that interview on the part of the state. Uh, it was more brought up in the context of people saying, you know, I, I applied for a training program and all there was was an online questionnaire. I never spoke with anyone directly. And again, not having that relational piece and kind of comparing it to other um, training in other areas that do very much do sort of an assessment that is a whole person kind of taking into consideration different factors versus just filling out in an online questionnaire. Um, so if anything, I would say the emphasis was more on uh really requiring or encouraging the training programs to incorporate that as part of their uh, role in this process. Uh -huh. Okay, so that was toward training programs, not... Yes, less. sorry. Yeah, sorry for the... Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Apple? Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'll build off of that. I also participated in this, in this project with Tasha, and you know, there was one individual who really talked about sort of this relationship that... The, they thought the relationship was so important, both with their students and with the medicines, and that like some students would acquire the skills and be able to like facilitate sooner than others, because it was more of a skill based, you're more of a skill based um, profession overall, which which I guess then brings me to just a couple of things I want to highlight is like one of the big themes was around experience and skills and that you know and what people learn in class doesn't quite do it and so how do you how do you really double down on this experience piece I think it's this mentorship it's increasing practicums and it's continuing education as well and I think one easy thing we heard too was you know from a peer support group is there a way to if you're, if you're requiring or let me take a step back. It, can you can we encourage facilitator peer support groups through a continuing education requirement? And that as a way it's like also sort of like increase skill and increase experience. Um, so yeah, just big picture, I just want to really highlight that experience and skills were some you know big themes that came out of what people thought a good facilitator um, would have. Hey. I just wanted to echo the, excuse me, the importance of the facilitator peer support groups. Um, that is actually something that's really helpful when you're out there and on being underground like I was for years. Um, you didn't have that support group. So it really takes a toll on your own spirituality, your own mental health taking on a lot of transferring a lot of those other people's emotions and energies. Um, so having that support group, um, which I eventually did find is what helped out a lot with that. Um, I also wanted to echo the importance of the face to face scenario training. I think that would be really important. And I also like the idea of the Zendo project coming towards practicum. Um, from my experience sitting in, even with Zendo, I've sat in with uh, Insomniacs, Oasis Center, Relentless Beats, Harm Reduction group that they have. And as a trip sitter, the most extreme cases that I have come across are people that are overstimulated at music festivals. They've got lights, they've got music, they've got everything going on, and they're having a freak out. A lot of times that they're brought into the Oasis Centers, it's because they're already freaking out. Security doesn't know how to handle it, and they don't want to just give them a ketamine shot and sedate them and send them out in an ambulance. So they bring them to us, and that really helps develop a lot of those skills um, in an in-person way. So while we're trying to build up you know, healing centers, I think that that would be a really good idea for us to add in as practicum. Thank you, Ms. Kitap. Yes, thank you, Tasha, for all of your work and the team's work. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation. Um, I have a curiosity around, um, you had mentioned CE uh, ongoing and continuing education, and you mentioned supervision and ongoing supervision. I'm curious in um, this process if anything came up around uh, disciplinary 
systems of disciplinary action, and it, it may be beyond the scope of what you were looking at and exploring, but I'm curious if that came up in terms of, um, yeah, how to address uh, discipline issues in the space um, once somebody has already gone through the training and um, how that connects to ongoing supervision. Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Lisa. Um, so I wouldn't say that these conversations got deep into that, except for to emphasize, you know, the state should have a really good uh, system set up for um, those types of situations. And then kind of the question as well of how do we frame this recognizing that that missteps are going to happen, that this is a continuous learning process? Um, where do you draw the line? You know, if, if something happens um, that it reaches a level of violation, what happens in that case is, you know, revoking someone's license? Do people get a second chance? Um, I think just the need for careful consideration around all of those questions. But I wouldn't say that we got into deep detail as to what the specific recommendations are. So maybe that's for the next round. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Hi, thanks. I had to exit for a second, Tasha, so I wasn't able to see your entire presentation, but uh, thank you for your work, you know, in this. I wanted to just build on a couple of these, you know, comments um, and, you know, I, I'll just express that I'm, I'm juxtaposing this dynamic of high barriers to entry, high costs of these training programs versus this more philosophical question, which many of us have been pointing to, which is, are these training programs actually enough to provide this level of holistic service? And, you know, the one thing I wanted to point out was that there was a call, I think what you said about reducing the number of hours for the sake of various or costs and, you know, some of those things. And I find that to be problematic, you know, um, in my, one of my roles as a co-founder of Psychedelic Passage is vetting facilitators to join our referral network of which our minimum requirement is 40 clients. And when you're thinking about that, those 40 clients alone adds up to 500 experiential hours. And so to hold that in juxtaposition with Oregon, where a barbering license takes 746 hours of which, you know, 400, at least over half of that is, um, you know, practical, you know, application. And so to think about, well, one could argue whether cutting hair are matters of the soul, because a lot of people share, you know, their deepest, darkest things there. But I just want to like add this in context to, you know, this work that we're doing, which does intersect with mental health, does intersect with spiritual health, it does intersect with medical health. And my argument is that the requirements should actually be higher, I, I believe, because we are really at this crucial juncture point, especially with the first year of this programming and the regulatory models around, um, you know, like Sarah had mentioned instances of uh, how do we handle uh, claims of facilitator abuse? How do we handle claims of client abuse, let's say? And what I found is that even, even if you've gone through 40 one-on-one -on -one clients, you might still only have a percentage of exposure to the breadth and depth of work that is encompassing of psychedelic, you know, facilitation. Um, I found folks who have supported 900 individuals and they're still ongoingly learning and being like, ah, this is a new thing that I hadn't encountered before in all of my clients. And so I just want to raise this philosophical question. I can see that this does segue into our conversation about the draft of requirements here, but I think there's a larger philosophical question on, okay, even if we have X amount of hours and we cover all of these points and things, does that actually prepare somebody to work in the unknown, to work in the mystery, uh, which is just embedded into psychedelic work? So just thank you for hearing my comments here. Thank you so much. Dr. Malcolm, I saw your hand up earlier. Did you have another question? Yeah, I, I, I kind of wanted to comment, but my internet got really choppy. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, so so I think that this is a really important conversation, and I really appreciate like Jimmy's comments and just sort of like even hearing that there is a training program in Oregon that would allow you to be admitted without having any kind of like face-to-face -face interaction. On the one hand, it's kind of like, oh, that sounds great. There's like this 
lower barrier to accessibility to the programs to me is just sort of something like, wow, that's a predatory program that's just trying to enroll people and turn like a, a quick kind of dollar, right? Like I kind of think that this is a, your training program should be like, this is a real profession that people are going to be in, involved in. Like this is a choice that they're going to make to do this for their living, to help people in this, in this kind of way. So I think approaching it like, thing and it doesn't have to be doctorate level hours of experience say so things like that because it's not a doctor you know it's like tailor it to what it is but sort of like look towards that those kinds of things because all of these issues that you're talking about like the philosophical things that jimmy's bringing up is exactly what we used to sit around in faculty meetings at the school of pharmacy and talk about all day long because it's just kind of like okay how do we teach a student pharmacist to be compassionate to a patient. How many hours will it take before they understand how to have a compassionate response? And some kids in their interview, you understand they already have that compassionate response and some persons are wicked smart and organized and everything else. But you know, it, the, the interaction is tough and you really need to work on those kind of skills. And then, yeah, when are you ready? It's kind of like, okay, like, honestly, how many consults have I done? I've seen a lot of things. I haven't seen everything and something all the time. Frankly, it's just kind of like, that's an illness I've not even heard of. And I did do a doctor program in two years of postgraduate residency. And, it, it, you know, so, so yeah, it's kind of like, when is a person ready for the deep end? And how deep does the deep end go? I mean, it, it, it gets, right? So having these sort of like layers where, yeah, there is some sort of bar to, to entry in an interview thing. And a, a, like, yeah, this person feels like a good fit for us as a student with a training program. And, you know, we can tell from what the student's talking about that they're really like ready for this kind of like training sort of like program. And then from there, okay, when they graduate and they've done a certain number of basic hours, yeah, what are the mechanisms for continuing education, peer support, peer accountability, um, I think I, I don't have like the answers, but I would vote like a big yes for like all of those sorts of themes and this kind of like tiered approach that leads people into this profession, starting probably at persons that we suspect are the kind of shallow end of experience and graduating in different ways with different sorts of persons that have higher degrees of, of experience in different, maybe even specific types of, of, of persons that are struggling with, you know, intentions. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Chavez, and then I'm going to end with Dr. Chavez, but we're continuing this discussion because the next step is to bring up our draft of education requirements. And so all these things are very pertinent. So what I wanted to share was um, the requirements, because I, I agree with what the individual was saying about requirement that should be even higher. And, um, but, you know, Lundy and uh, several people on, on our committees have talked about the cost. And the cost for a lot of communities of color might, you know, keep them out of um, participating as a facilitator or becoming a facilitator because they can't afford um, the extra hours that might be required. And in in many indigenous communities and communities of color in, Do in Denver, New Mexico, and Arizona, which are the areas that I tend to be familiar with, you have what are called campulis. And those are like peer support groups. And for example, in Curandedismo, they often say that you have to do 2,000 limpias in order to be close to having a level of competency. And a limpia might be a half hour or it might be two hours. But the point is that it's a lot of hours. So if we can figure out how to create requirements for those volunteer programs, we've heard some great things about people who are volunteering from the individuals who have been talking, who have been exposed to um, the different types of reactions. This is really important. We really do need those hours, but tacking them onto a training program, which is going to charge people and cost more is not the way to do it. That that's just, we, we do need people to be exposed. We do need those companies or their support groups, but we can't, we have to figure out how to do that without adding more hours to a training program that then charges our facilitators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Dr. Beachy. 
keeping yeah, in mind we're really ready to move on. I hope that we will um, have uh, there'll be an option for peer support as we've been talking about in the proposal that you're moving forward. But I do have concern that the field is so new and um, like Dr. Chavez is saying, um, experience is really important. So I hope there would be some kind of, you know, designated leader of the peer support group or someone facilitating the group who has some kind of uh, deeper insight or wisdom. So it isn't just, a, you know, several people just graduating from a psychedelic certificate program, all supporting each other and, you know, circulating like less than, um, you know, good information and, and practices that may not be really in line with what we're hoping. Yes, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, so our last um, meeting agenda item here is looking at, at um, looking at um, our draft of education requirements. Um, so as we move into this discussion, it's more of a continuation, I think, of, of the discussion. I just want to thank Healing Advocacy Fund again for, for the data they presented. I think um, there's definitely pieces of this that likely need to be built into this. Um, I do want to give a little bit of context to, I said this last time too, but I, I, I just want to give this context again. Um, Senate Bill 23290 actually outlines education and experiential requirements and qualifications. Um, so there are requirements already in the legislation, um, especially as that pertains to having certain modules. Um, so those modules are um, participant safety, drug interactions, contraindications, mental health and state, physical health and state, social and cultural considerations, preparation, administration, integration, and ethics. Um, what, it, what Senate Bill 23290 does not give us is information about what needs to be in those modules. Um, so we do need to make sure that those, rec those modules are present in whatever education program we recommend, um, and that training programs at a bare minimum are covering those specific modules. We can add sections, we can add modules, we can go into detail about these specific modules. Um, and training programs have are at liberty to and create additional pieces. And someone else already brought this up, um, but it's perfectly okay as long as a training program has these bare minimum modules um, to offer specific specializations, a different additional training areas or um, different requirements or focus, as long as the merit minimums are met. Um, so this is slightly different than what I presented last time. The main differences are trying to incorporate some of the feedback we had last time. So everything in black um, on this um, under each module is really um, coming from the Oregon uh, regulation um, and, and what's included in, in Oregon training. The only difference is um, having to reorganize those because the modules in Senate Bill 23290 are so different. Um, everything in red is additional things I, that were added based on feedback from my last meeting. So most of this, um, I want to give credit again to Mr. Eshelman, and that most of this is coming from him and his recommendations. Um, so I did try to incorporate all of his feedback in some way, shape, or form. Some of it I added into some of the existing modules, but I did create a standalone self-care module um, at his recommendation. So I think nearly everything is is um, represented here, Mr. Eshelman, but though I'd love your feedback on that. Um, the one difference is, is this um, question about energy is I did broaden that a little bit just because different traditions and perspectives kind of identify that and name that different things. So allowing some more inclusivity there, um, you know, if a, if a program were more spiritually oriented or more oriented toward traditional psychotherapy, where we might use the term like wise mind instead of energiness. So just trying to allow some flexibility there. Um, and I don't want to, you know, I, I want to kind of focus in on two questions today, specifically, I, I would love feedback on this, but um, really it's this question of length of training. Um, oh, I should add too, I added in Dr. Hughes' language about the practicum experience, but also hearing um, the data we just got presented that likely that needs to be longer than 40 hours. Um, so that section is completely different based on, on the the wording that she presented. Um, so the two questions that I wanted to focus on are really the length of training and this question of an accelerated training program and how 
what that might look like, how we could facilitate that to allow for legacy healers, to allow for people that have a great deal of experience in this field um, to accelerate through training um, a little quicker. Um, in the Oregon model, um, the onus of responsibility for that is on training programs. My understanding from Dora's staff is that in Colorado, um, the state will be taking on the responsibility for evaluating accelerated um, training applications. It's just a question of what that actually looks like um, and, and how we kind of verify training and things like that. So with that, I would love some feedback. Lundy. Hey, Dr. Hannum. Um, I have an indirect response that I think is, is my way of wanting to maybe create a foundation of context for this conversation around, I think of a specific archetype when you ask those questions. Um, and the archetype I think of, and this is just an example, but a licensed professional counselor, someone who has a licensed mental health degree already, they live in Pueblo and they're a single mom. And how do the length of training requirements create massive barriers along the way? So for example, the inclusion of in-person supervision. I don't know how many people would even be qualified to provide that in Southwest and Southern Colorado based on the scarcity of just generalized providers already. Um, and I also think about the fact of, you know, in-person experientials to drive up to Boulder just for a weekend, potentially to do an intensive, to get some of those hours done in an intensive way. That would be an additional thousands or thousands of dollars for childcare, travel, stay, the program itself. So I, I think um, I'm curious how we can approach this in a way that's iterative. I've heard the word iterative a lot you know, such as the accelerated program being particular to the different modules, right? Because a person may have a lot of experience in one regard, but not a lot of experience in other regards. Um, therapists who are licensed have varying uh, training around equity, for example. So I just, I think that there um, could be a lot of bias that guide these decisions if we aren't careful to kind of slow ourselves down and really think about the context of Colorado and how how treatment plays itself out throughout the state. So thank you for that, Lundy. I always appreciate you holding space for, for the most marginalized and, and the equity issues um, in this conversation. And I think it is a, a really important perspective to build in. You know, I think another kind of additional thing that I forgot to add is, you know, this question about all these folks that these 500 folks that are getting trained in Oregon and are we gonna allow those folks to get that licensure in Colorado? What if their training programs look totally different than the, what we're creating? Um, what happens then? So I appreciate that. Dr. Beachy. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation today. This is all really engaging. Two quick comments. One is that um, I would hope, to Lindy's point, I would hope that um, that there would be an option for online mentoring or, um, you know, distance learning through uh, for the individual supervision because that's a you know something we rely on quite a bit in um, in the maps PBC training program you know Sarah and I are both supervisors and um, I think that can work really well if it's a secure platform and that really helps helps address access and then the other the other uh, comment I have is in point um, point two here that at least 50% of the training should be online synchronous learning if it's not in person. I completely agree with that. But what I found from teaching online as a professor and also, you know, um, at helping to establish, you know, being a founder for Neuropus Psychedelic Assisted Therapy Program is that offering a webinar where people may or may not be engaged is very different from a small group online environment where everyone, you know, it needs to be in screen, on screen unless they have an accommodation and there's actually engaged um, learning where people have to be as if they were in person. And so I think to clarify that a little bit would be important because what we don't want is training centers just um, putting up webinars for like 500 people and you have no idea if someone's attending or if they just logged in and they're, you know, grocery shopping or something like that. So I think that would be important to um, clarify with maybe just an additional sentence or 
Would you suggest capping to clarify that or more just requiring? Well, I don't think a cap is necessarily important, but maybe you could just think about the faculty to student ratio. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if there's a one to 500 ratio, that's not ideal, but if you have one uh, lecturer and then you have a um, hundred students and there are 10 small group leaders, that would be, you know, 10 like TAs that could be reasonable. I know um, Dr. Vanderbush developed, you know, various approaches to this and, and Sarah Gale could comment on this as well, but there's uh, different ways that we've been exploring as, as these training centers are developing how to create really engaged environments where people really do have to show up. And they also receive feedback because they're visible in the space and they're not just invisible to the um, learning environment. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Ms. Quinta? Um, I just wanted to mention that we did touch on the question around accelerated training a little bit in our interviews. And specifically, I asked some of those Oregon operators if they were, because in Oregon, they do allow people to pass out of certain modules. And I asked, you know, are you actually doing that? And what they, what I got, at least from the people we talked to, and I don't know if this is the case across the board, is that logistically, it's really challenging. Um, they basically said, you know, we don't necessarily have the staff or the capacity to be vetting reviewing transcripts, doing all these things. Um, so what it, it's meant in practice is that everyone kind of is getting the same training. Um, so I don't think, again, that that necessarily has to be the case. But what, what came out of that for me is thinking about maybe this option to allow a training program to kind of establish as an accelerated training option from the onset and then come forward with sort of their framework for how they're navigating that. If, there, if there's a way to do that in cooperation with Dora um, that they could actually present, okay, here's how we're going to vet and we're going to go into it with the intention of, um, you know, working with licensed clinical social or, you know, or, or, sorry, licensed clinicians, not specifically so social workers necessarily. Um, and so having the capacity in that sense to do some of the work that uh, Lundy is referencing of like really looking individually at what what is somebody's history and training and what do they bring to this. Um, and that might be a different program than one that's really geared towards that foundational training that's kind of for everyone. Um, so I think that, that that kind of approach could be worth considering. Um, and then the other thing why Zoom just kind of freaked out at the end of the last uh, section. So I just wanted to mention that um, I, I just encourage everyone, if you, yeah, I know you have a ton of reading, um, but there are a lot more kind of ideas and thoughts for consideration. I think some of which do touch on these equity considerations contained in that report. Um, so if you have the time to read it, I encourage doing so. And I'm also happy to come back on in future if it's helpful to answer questions, or we can potentially get the people who actually participated to come um, and speak and do follow up if that's helpful. Um, so just want to share that. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know, Ms. Bratton or, or someone else from Dora, I may get a comment from Dora's staff about what Dora would be able to handle in terms of accelerated training, and, and maybe it's a question for next time to give you some time to think about that. Or Mr. Brahmi, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that. I, I, I do have thoughts. I, I think it's a key component to this entire program, um, having an option where people in the community have been doing this safely and responsibly, um, whether they've been doing this in a um, indigenous or spiritual religious practice um, through a lineage can um, go through uh, a training program and potentially not have to pay additional costs for added courses um, and what is and, and stick to what is just be generally required in, uh, in in statute or in rules, right? Like we have participant safety, drug interactions, I think it's about seven and we added two more um, to what was in statute. And then if we add a third one um, around state law training, um, but I, I, th I think it's extremely important to offer it um, and find a way to do it. We just need to figure out um, the the structure of doing it in a manner that doesn't reflect on the cost for the licenses uh, for the applicants because I I'm a, as we've talked about for like months that I think the the concern rate is like costs coming down uh, onto the licenses because we're a cash fund program 
So what you require the agency specifically to do um, at DOR regarding the licensing or even DOR when we're in the other subcommittees um, can get reflected on the program. But it, if there is an opportunity for us to find a way to, to structure it, that it, it wouldn't associate it to the cost of the licenses, we should definitely do it. And um, that's something that I'm working on uh, identifying right now. And, and I can add on that, that it, it, in the application process, the criteria that is required um, will be collected during that time. That is not, as long as it's set up in advance, a lot of that information that will look at allow them to be in the accelerated aspect, which can be collected there. So, um, it, it, you know, they'll be able to do that at the forefront, which would not, from that applying uh, part of it, not cost anything additional. I appreciate it. Dr. Pester, seeing your hand, I wanted to add that I did add your section about quality control too. I forgot to give you credit for that, but that's in, in the new version as well. Do you have a comment or yeah, uh, question. Well, first, thank you for your kindness. But uh, secondly, uh, so I just wanted to be clear too, because this is, because I also teach, we have, uh, have been teaching at a number of schools online as well. And so I think this is apropos to kind of what we're discussing with that, uh, the training. And if I, I just want to be super clear, so it says here for training that not, is not conducted in person, at least 50% of the training shall be conveyed through online synchronous learning. So the other 50% can be asynchronous, if I'm, if I'm understanding that properly. Yeah, and that's a regulation I, I take an ex from Oregon. So that is not right. some, you know, that's a draft, but that is what Oregon has in there. Well, then something, because I, I so agree with so many of the comments I've heard about really, you know, there's no replacement for having just hands-on training and working closely with uh, trusted instructors and trusted facilitators and mentors. But the reason I bring this up is you actually had mentioned this um, regarding perhaps putting a cap on enrollment. And I've had both circumstances where I've been the sole instructor and I've also had assistance in the, like in a virtual classroom. And because there's an asynchronous option, I think that one provides a lot of flexibility right there for programs because, you know, people can take classes as they choose on their own time, that sort of thing. But I don't think it's a problem to necessarily have some sort of enrollment cap for the synchronous programs in order to ensure there's some sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, or, or more personalized approach. Because I do agree that this is such specialized work and there's going to be so many really important questions. And especially after hearing Tasia's presentation, I think that that is, I don't know if there's that's possible. I don't know if that's something that you can do, but that I don't think that it's bad or maybe that's up to the programs to enforce like an enrollment cap per class. I'm not sure. Um, but when you said that, I was like, yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. So I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. I think that that would be within our rights, but um, I'll have the AG chime in if that's not <laughs> in terms of a possibility. Um, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. I just want to do uh, reinforce uh, Dr. Beachy's comment. It's about you know, what I was hearing was better defining what synchronous learning means. Is it, a, is, is it, does that mean that the entire cohort is learning synchronously? Is that enough for smaller groups of three to five to 10 individuals? Does that count as synchronous? Is it enough for, you know, a participant in a training program to be having one-on-one -on -one advisement with, you know, an individual? Then this raises a, a further question of what I think Lundy was saying about what's online versus in person and some of the you know barriers there. This brings up conversation about um, shadowing, about you know uh, apprenticeship, and to what degree that's included you know in these training programs. I'll also reinforce a point made before about what's the vetting process for these folks to actually engage in the training program. And it seems to me like the asynchronous learning could cover a wealth of primer material, which actually may actually then qualify somebody to, to Dr. Kester's point about actually joining into synchronous programming where the personality of that individual, their you know, skill set, their modality can actually play in. And so, you know, I, I view this almost as like a step order process to where 
There may be uh, a, a asynchronous portion online uh, DIY on your own time that gets you into the door, let's say, to synchronous programs, of which those synchronous learning may get you into the door to supervisory or apprenticeship. I just wanted to invite in some of those ideas, and I'm not sure what's in the realm of scope of this you know, committee, but it's kind of um, synthesizing a little bit of what I'm hearing from a lot of great points throughout. So thank you for that. Thank you for your much, Dr. Chavez. So I wanted to support everything that I'm hearing because um, Dr. Beachy made, um, you know, she gave a really good example of what I've been seeing since post-COVID, during, before COVID, a lot of indigenous communities would travel to Guatemala, to Mexico, to different parts, even, you know, within the United States. And then during COVID, all of that came to a stop. And so a lot of indigenous groups are using um, uh, the internet to be able to continue to teach the practices. And they are small groups. They're groups of about 10 to 15, at least the ones that I've attended. And so uh, um, the modalities are being, um, you know, like some, they have your camera on and, and modalities are being demonstrated and, you know, group work is being demonstrated and then there's communication. So I, I think that opens up a lot of support, you know, especially for those for, so that it's cost effective and those who have, um, uh, you know, access issues that Lindy was talking about, that single mom, you know, it, it opens things up for that. And we still, and you have a lot of indigenous people who are participating in this. So it, it fits within the comfort, if you will, of the indigenous groups that are out there because, you know, we have to learn how to readjust things that were only done in person. Post-COVID are now, you know, our world opened up as well to accept some new ways of teaching and, and practicing. So I just want to say this is totally in alignment with what we would also include in the indigenous committee and indigenous and spiritual committee. So um, thank you all for, for your contributions. Thank you so much, Lundy. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. And Dr. Hannum, I think you deserve a huge thanks for putting this together so thoughtfully. Um, and throughout the months, this is incredible. So um, with that said, I actually have an idea that could potentially address quality and equity, which is uh, let's make training programs responsible for um, identifying the acceleration and even the state transfer. Um, by that, I mean, think about, uh, clinical mental health programs, right? Students can test out of classes, um, students do practicum, um, the school holds liability insurance, even for students doing practicum. So in the same way, what if training programs receive the students and if students want to test out of the core state competency modules that the training program then is the assessor of, yes, we believe we don't need to teach you this that could subsidize the cost of the training but then every student is required to apply to the state with a training certification as part of um, their acceptance so that we relieve the burden on the state assessment and instead we are receiving that these students have been um, vetted and certified by these licensed training programs um, i think that could address both the cross state issue as well as the acceleration issue. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. I, I mean, I think that's in line with Oregon's model, but correct me if I'm wrong about that. I, I think that's what Oregon's regulations say. I don't know if anyone knows for certain. Well, <laughs> I think I'm not sure, but that, but I, I think um, there's some benefits to that idea. Poker fan, for sure. Oh, so thank Ashley, you. yeah, I'm curious what Ashley has to say too. Oh, so. Ashley, yes, sorry. You're <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, I'll throw out there that one of the kind of material distinctions that you might want to keep in mind is that Oregon requires an exam uh, that this that I think the state administers, and so um, even at the end of this kind of training process, the state is going to be kind of assessing and judging each candidate um, to ensure that they have a certain body of knowledge um, that is going to be different than Colorado, because Colorado doesn't have an exam set out in 
its statutory authority, um, at least as of today. I don't expect that's going to be part of your world. So I, would, I just want to be cautious about approaching the idea of ceding uh, the state's authority to, and frankly, requirement mandate to evaluate applicants as being properly trained and, and qualified um, by giving training programs uh, kind of the full uh, uh, authority over whether to exempt out of certain components. Um, it, it will kind of transfer the, the this essentially the program's authority to evaluate and assure that those individuals have met all of the qualifications. Now, there may be some hybrid ground where you can um, have the, the training programs essentially make that first step and assessment and make recommendations and then uh, part of the program kind of weigh in after that. Um, I, I think it's worth kind of putting a pin in that, giving some thought to it. Let's let's see, you know, let's challenge Lori and Sam to go off and, and do some thought around kind of how much discretion the program can give away to the training programs. But at the end of the day, uh, the program's required to kind of make that assessment on qualification. And, I, and so I just want to bring that out as a possibility. Uh, to think about just because it is a materially different than Oregon in the sense that there's no exam. Okay. Dr. Hamden, can I briefly follow up since it was for my question? Mm -hmm. So um, are you saying actually that essentially there, the, because of that lack of inclusion of an exam, what is the measure to which the state can affirm the, the training and qualifications um, potentially in some automated way in the application process? But at the same time, the trainings are holding responsibility for still verifying that these people are qualified and have met the requirements. I'm not sure that I've gone that far. Okay. Uh, right. What I what I want to put out there is that because the state is uh, right, the, this division, this this program is required for. Uh, required to assess the qualifications of applicants and ensure that they meet the required, the minimum required qualifications. So if you're, yeah, the program would have to authorize training programs essentially to allow app their students to opt out of certain portions of that uh, training curriculum. I'm not sure that uh, the program is in a place yet where they are, uh, where they would be comfortable or willing to do that. I think that's something that Lori and Sam need to speak to. Um, I think depending on kind of how the program decides it wants to look in, look at it, you guys can make recommendations around what may or may not work with the not structure. And that's just something to think about. At this stage, we're talking about recommendations to the program, right? And and proposed draft rules. I think that if you think it makes sense to have training programs exempt out, then I think we need to, uh, I think you should set some criteria around how you can ensure that, that, that the program can ultimately at the end of the day uh, be assured that it be that applicants meet all of the requirements for that education on it. Okay. I think there's going to be some sort of, some sort of collaboration that's going to have to happen. And I'm not sure, uh, that's an easy analysis right now. Just, I just want to put that out there for you. Right. Um, I think it's less easy than Oregon because Oregon gets to, administer an exam to every applicant and and assure themselves that uh, all applicants are fully qualified based on the score of the exam. Assume, presuming that the exam actually gives appropriate basis for 
right? Knowledge to test the knowledge. And recognizing, sorry, recognizing certainly that some of those um, kind of observational and actual skills may not be tested by the exam. I don't know. And just to clarify, it would require a change in legislation to require an exam in Colorado. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Dr. King. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And, and that actually was answering some of the questions I was getting ready to ask. So thank you so much for that. Uh, because as somebody that's very interested in offering the didactic classes for this program, you know, if we're headed down this road a little bit, I can tell you, and I'm sure I'm speaking for others, I would, uh, to Lundy's point, which I think is so, such a great, interesting way to approach this to try and lower the burden on so many folks by having the programs assess the uh, people's qualifications. I would just ask if, if that does happen, because I know Sam and Lori, you were brought up into this as well, because obviously this is kind of, this is going to be indoors purview, but I know as a, a future program administrator, hopefully, um, I would want to know exactly where that begins and ends from my liability standpoint. And to make sure that, you know, as we're offering these programs, like I want nice clear language as to what can I accept, what's appropriate, you know, or do I have lots of freedom um, in, in doing so? Because I know I wouldn't be the only one asking this, but there's a bunch of us that want to do right and make sure we're, we're doing what is asked of us. But it seems like that could be kind of a gray area at this point. So wherever that kind of shapes up with the board, I'd want just some extra clarity if that's possible. And just one more point, um, Mr. Wynn, uh, he, the way he was talking about the set of the classes going back a little bit, he totally made my point for me. Um, and I think he brought us some great points about just the way we bring these courses in and, and there's some discussion, sorry, I know I'm jumping back a little bit, but, uh, sort of, sort of vetting people. And I feel like if we do like some of the easier to offer asynchronous classes, say like, the chem, neurochem, neurophys type classes that can be more of an asynchronous type of uh, course offering. I, I've noticed, at least in Chinese medicine, it tends to vet people as they work their way through the program as well. So some of this can offer the ability for people to self-select as they move through some of the less expensive, less burdensome asynchronous classes. They may decide that actually this isn't the right fit for them too. So this, this might be an organic type of approach to that. Uh, might make this process of these recommendations a little bit easier as well. So thanks for listening. Great, thank you. I'm going to skip to Mr. Barani and then go back again and Dr. Vanderbeer Beer Thank you. I, yeah, it, I think this is a, a, this is something I work on for a uh, November meeting where we're talking about like the, specifically the nuance on what we could do for accelerated or the training programs um, and well, understanding how that cost might be reflected. If it's on the licenses, um, if it's like adding you know, requ requirements on direct um, on, on the agency or the program, right? To now create tests and, and do audits and then I need to dig into that a little bit more. And that's what I was hoping that we can um, kind of focus on the educational components that um, Dr. Hannum had hit here. So we could follow up on that, on any other edits that we might have on education and be ready to discuss like accelerated at the next, uh, at the November meeting. And I think by that time I'll, I'll have a better understanding of um, what we could do in rulemaking compared to what would be uh, a legislative task. Uh, Dr. Gainsbury? Thank you. Um, so just a word of context for my comments. We, we've been training a few hundred people a year now for a few years and a year long training that's almost 300 hours for licensed service only. And for our own um, be able to sleep at night, we decided that in order to vet students 
we would make sure that they are not practicing on a restricted license or had their license revoked before they come into our training. If they have issues with their license, then we can look into it on a case by case basis. But we felt like it was really important from a liability standpoint, not to turn out people with a graduation certificate who have questionable, um, potentially criminal uh, backgrounds. Um, the, the nature of the work is so sensitive. You want to be really careful about it. You even take into a program. Um, and I don't know how that would be done with the wellness level of people who don't have a license that you can easily pull and look at as a matter of public record. Um, is that a criminal background checked and, you know, do people consent to that? How does that work? So I just want to put that on the table as I think vetting students on the front end is important. Um, and then yeah, I'm just curious, I don't understand why a training program wouldn't have a final exam, um, for graduating a program. Um, I guess every training can be different and I understand what we're talking about as a state exam. Um, but to me, it makes sense that it be a final exam in the training and then also be a state exam or some other way for the state. And as you said, Ashley, it would require, you know, a legislative change, but some way for the state to decide if the state is satisfied with the competency of the person and their qualifications and so forth. Um, and then finally, just want to say that, you know, in any educational environment, um, like take college, you're going to go to a, a lecture where you get a didactic education, 500 people in the room. But you're also going to go into um, very small, very uh, hands-on environments. And I think uh, one of the hidden benefits of COVID is that a lot of us in the training space had to figure out how to do that online. And now there's a lot that can be done online um, to see how people do and what additional support they need as students. Um, I still believe that in-person training is also necessary for practical experience, but there's just a lot of variety of different ways this can be done. I guess I'll love Dr. Yen, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Vanderbeer, is your program approved in Oregon? It is. Can, yes. Can you, um, can you tell me, um, and you guys are um, approved by the HEC, which would be like the, is it, is that right? Like, I think that's the equivalent of like higher education. No, we're not approved by HEC. And the reason we're approved in Oregon and not approved by HEC is that, uh, we came in with people in a profession. They, they were already clinical therapists. And so HEC is about, it's a trade school, uh, protection for people who are learning a new, uh, trade or they're gaining a new profession. So because we don't train people who don't already have as too many negatives in a sense, but we only tra train people who already have a profession. So we weren't covered under the HEC umbrella as a result of that. Okay. And so is it Oregon still Simon services that approves the, the training program? Okay. And then the, the test rate is that, um, the state test. Um, that that's open book, but for your final exams is who does, does the state or does, uh, psilocybin services do any audit or anything like that? Of our the internal final exam? Yeah. No, no. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, I had my hand up a while ago and something happened. So it's been a while, but I think it's, it's still relevant. Um, just wanting to, uh, presence, you know, this interplay that we're talking about between, um, cost and program cost and quality control and equity and, uh, regarding affordability of programs. Um, so I just think that, you know, things, um, that can potentially increase the cost of a program. And Jamie was speaking to, you know, these uh, synchronous um, staff and student ratio and uh, more in-depth screening and um, this sort of conversation of is the burden on the state versus the training programs. Just wanting to presence, and I might be speaking the obvious here, that any time that there's, you know, more additional work that a training program needs to do than that, um, increases the staffing needs, it increases the cost of a program, which increases the access. And um, 
you know, so potentially an argument here for state assistance with this, um, with the assessments in particular, and exploring some maybe creative funding solutions. I wasn't able to come to the last meeting, and um, so I'm not as uh, in touch with conversations around money and budgeting and funding and all that, but I just want to bring that into our awareness of, you know, that this, any time that we're increasing the you know, staffing of a program and increasing the cost and, and the effect of that. Yes, thank you for that point. Um, so the entire program is cash funded as of now, meaning licensure cost is what pays for the state's role in it. So, yeah, Mr. Brahmi, did you have something to add? That, and, and that, that's reflected on the, the licensing fees, but uh, I think in our public health and health equity subcommittee, we we had these discussions on, um, you know, equity licenses, uh, grants, um, and uh, um, how that's done. I mean, we have some examples in the state specifically regarding cannabis with the cannabis business office. Their funds are bifurcated um, from the Department of Revenue um, through recreational uh, cannabis sales. And... Um, I think that would have to take up a, a that would have to go through the legislature and that's out of our rulemaking authority. But I think what we can do is kind of identify what the market is in the first year, see what the revenues are to those uh, to the sales, and if there's opportunities in most likely not the first year um, for some sort of model like similarly, but. Um, the second or third year. And I think one, one day, if you want to talk about this, I saw your hand go up, but not, not sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're trying to figure out a, a pathway to do that, um, or address inequity, uh, through grants or loans. Um, and when I, when I talk about that, I'm, I'm, I'm it's multifaceted, but I, I think we always come back to um, equity licenses for business businesses, um, and not often enough on uh, the uh, sold. Thank you, Queen Chat. Um, I just wanted to mention one more thing that I think connects us to this coming out of the discussions we had, which was also a call for kind of in general raising the bar a little bit for who could run a training program um, with the sense that there's a little bit maybe too low of a bar in Oregon and um, who is actually doing the training, of course, is going to have a huge implication in terms of the outcomes. And I think that just connects to this piece as well if you're in a situation where you're potentially giving even more discretion to the training programs and that would be even kind of a heightened importance. Um, and then in terms of the actual curriculum, I know that we're, we're talking a lot about structural stuff, um, but since I think you're also looking for feedback on this curriculum, I just want to kind of raise up again some of the things I mentioned, which um, in particular, the way that Oregon framed its minimum requirements, um, I think the pieces around trauma were nested into other areas, so they didn't have their own hour carve out, which gives, again, a lot of discretion that they could be really glossed over. So I think just thinking really carefully about what those pieces are that do deserve their own uh carve out which i you know tried to outline there so i don't want to repeat everything just want to highlight that no that's not why i'd already written that down based on your presentation <laughs> yeah you know i i think more and more and and tazia i'm bouncing off a bit on what you're saying um there needs to be really clear delineations of liability between training programs and the state because, you know, for example, as a licensed professional counselor, um, I'm now required to attest to meeting my continuing education requirements, but then the state can hold discretion on who they audit to, you know, verify that those were signed and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of attestations when you renew your license. And um, to the point that Ms. Moeller made, I think that there is this, this balance that we're looking for for clear liability differentiation. Because if we give no liability to training programs, we are setting ourselves up for a host of issues um, at the state side. But then having a clear you know, validation that doesn't increase cash costs for the state can also allow us a clear regulatory model that we're working within. So I, I, I yeah, I think I'm 
wanting to maybe bring back the conversation to how we can include within our education requirements the clear roles um, that the the licensed training programs provide. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and a, a piece kind of um, congruent to that, I think, is like who is making up those training programs. And there isn't anything in the Oregon regulations about that, um, but it's something I've been trying to figure out in my mind. There's just like a chicken and egg problem of like, who's going to be the practicum supervisors for the first round of trainees? Um, because they won't be licensed to any facilitators unless we figure out the accelerated training model and how can we verify, given that so much of this is new in terms of the regulatory side, how do we verify these trainers and, and that they really are legitimate in, in their training programs? It becomes very overwhelming. Dr. Beachy. Thank you. Um, regarding access, I, I appreciate um, Sarah's perspectives and just the conversation about, about access. I, I would, just as someone who's been involved in training programs, I, I would advocate for putting, you know, more of the burden on the training programs. Some of them are very high um, profit, you know, kind of programs. And I mean, it really varies across the board, but I think it would be reasonable to put a burden on the programs to have an equity um, a strategy and, and, you know, a, um, a particular um kind of named um, commitment to equity and access. I don't know what that would look like, but my sense is that the criticism that Oregon is is receiving, and Tasha and others can speak to this and Josh, but my sense is that it has a lot to do with the burden being put on the um, practitioners and not as much on the training programs, the practitioners and the state. And I think that's what we would hope to avoid in this you know, that now that we can learn from Oregon is really putting the burden of, um, you know, using resources well and and uh, ensuring access and equity and um, accessibility, you know, put that on the training programs because most of them are charging, you know, $12,000 per person. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money moving through training programs. And so I think that's a reasonable expectation. Thank you, Dr. Beachy. Um, so I'm aware of our time. Um, I have a hard stop at 445, so that gives us about 30 more minutes. And I um, feel a little anxiety, just to be transparent, because I'm presenting tomorrow on the full board meeting. <laughs> and I you know, just want to make sure that um, we have something to kind of bring forward. So we have these kind of edited version of the requirements in the packet. Um, it doesn't sound like we're very close in terms of coming up with hours of training, but I would love to hear thoughts if, if people have thoughts about how many hours this, the didactic pieces especially should be. Um, and knowing that it sounds like 40 hours of practicum may not be large enough, although maybe it's 40 hours in combination with some kind of consultation requirement or something like that, or thoughts about the specifics uh, in this document. I would love to hear those. Um, this is actually a question for Dr. Travis. Um, I'm curious within the, the world of um, Kuindera and um, just indigenous models of practice with natural medicines, what are some um, recommendations that we can glean from with, with the question that Dr. Hannum is asking? So within the indigenous model, as I mentioned earlier, we have what are called kaipulis. So those are groups of facilitators or groups of curanderos and curanderas. And then you have your group meetings, you have your trainings, and you have apprenticeships. So I'm, I'm looking at this and because... In, in our models, seriously, like like when I have events going on during the summer, money is not being exchanged, but instead people are helping to put the event together, put the training together. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes um, I've had both where I'm, I'm teaching classes and people are paying $50 a month. And then we've had series of classes where 
Um, everybody has to contribute to make sure the event takes place and you have 20 people training and they're part of apprenticeships. And I'm not kidding when I said to you that many curanderos and curanderas have said you have to do 2,000 sessions. That's a lot of hours. You know, we're talking about them. It's like 2,000 hours, right? If, if every session was an hour. And so we're talking about years. So it's kind of hard to squeeze the indigenous model into like a Western model very easily. It can be done with time and thoughtfulness, but that's a lot of hours go into apprenticeship and training in the indigenous models a lot. So, sorry. I mean, I... I you can't really put the package in there. You have to spend more time recognizing. That's why I really liked the online training, you know, the smaller groups of online training, because you can get a lot more, you know, uh, exchange of ideas and experiences. So how do we put that in here without people having to pay for that? How does that work with these peer supported groups? Thanks, Lundy. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. I will hold space for to get licensed as a psychologist. I had to do more than 2,000 hours of clinical hours and more than 2,000 two thousand hours of supervision, too. So that isn't outside the realm, I think. Uh, you know, it's much more than what Oregon's doing or what we've talked about yet. But, you know, I think there there is precedent for that level of experience. Dr. Vanderbeer? I was going to say the same thing. I appreciate Dr. Chavez and Dr. Klanem saying that. I think... To me, what resonates more is um, a brief, a briefer required training along with a requirement for consultation and supervision. Um, also, because I think that works better. I think um, the personal relationship with a, a consulting group and and a, and a super and or a supervisor helps to meet the individual needs of the person um, who's in training uh, more effectively. So that that's where I would go with. Thank you for that feedback. Can I turn the other question to you, Dr. Vanderbeer, too, just as someone who has a program and, and uh, is doing this work? Like, how do we vet the trainers and or those, you know, people providing the consultation or supervision? Well, first and foremost, I think they would have to be licensed facilitators in the program. Um, I mean, that would be a beginning point. And then I think you would want to see a certain number of um, hours, you know, like what Jimmy was saying, like a certain, uh, a very robust amount of hours of experience um maybe maybe sarah gal could speak to how maps does that because that's the thing that they've been trying to do over there i can speak to that just to know yeah absolutely <laughs> um yeah so for maps public benefit corporation a lot of the folks who are currently maps educators we're now using the term educators formerly used trainers um and supervisors and associate supervisors, um, there is a level of experience, the number of um, people that they have had to see within the clinical trials, which of course has been limited because the facilitators are all coming from people with a background in the clinical trials. And so there's a limited number of people who have been investigators in those trials. Um, and so, yeah, I know that that MAPS Public Benefit Corporation right now is, is working with the mentor educators and the current educator team to discuss what that will look like post-approval. And we just, we don't have that information quite yet. Thank you both. Dr. Beachy. Mm, yeah, thank you. As an associate supervisor with MAPS, and then I'm also speaking from, um, from just my understanding of the literature around apprenticeship, which is uh, um, recommended by several leading um, psychedelic education, you know, folks who are who are studying the efficacy of education these days i would really uh re reiterate what what has already been said about the importance of supervision and apprenticeship and so i think that's how we could also build on the um you know the oregon model is to require more um structured apprenticeship over time um and maybe some of the Maybe some of the teaching could be moved into apprenticeships, so we're not increasing hours that are required. But, um, for example, group facilitation could be done in a in a, a supervised capacity where the um, person seeking, you know, the 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 uh, license could be 
observed or could work, you know, in tandem with a, with a, a skilled facilitator. I think any, any ways to integrate this into apprenticeship would really be a improvement upon the Oregon model and um, that one-to-one -one skill building is so important, but also, you know, balancing equity and access so that it doesn't become outrageously expensive for, for that to happen, you know. The other quick comment is um, I would really encourage that the ethics module be required in person, but that's my personal um, you know, or at least synchronous. I don't think someone should just be able to take an ethics test online and then become a facilitator. Um, some of the content certainly could be provided online, but I think there's an element of um, in-person engagement with that topic in particular that feels feels compelling. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Lundy? Yeah, I'm going to share a personal anecdote and then speak to the hours. I um, was a recipient of a academy and assisted program a couple years ago, and one of the conflicts that came up for me was this conversation of self-care and the therapist embodying, you know, a balanced life, and then there being three hours twice a week of didactic education that I need to sit in after seeing, you know, eight meetings during my day and then it's like okay so what does that actually mean <laughs> in human life and time um and then on top of that you know how research is showing that distinction between training and learning and that you know we only really remember about 10 percent of training but learning really happens in that relational component and how that connects to a lot of liability and quality concerns we have and so i wonder if we can kind of take that approach of um, minimal viable didactic um, essentials that we have confidence will build a quality structure while making the supervision and consultation the robust component of um, what we require. I, I even, as a licensed professional counselor, have concern that consultation is not a requirement once you're licensed. Um, some of the therapists that I see cause the most harm are those that have been practicing for decades and have not consulted on the latest evidence-based um, and, uh, you know, constant ways our, our field is progressing. And in similar ways, I would have concern if someone just did an education program, got licensed as a facilitator, and then they never seek consultation again, right? So I'm, I'm just curious about how we can potentially be... Um, have quality assurance from a from the core competency side on the didactic component and a robust um, program for the supervisory. Because then you also have the person who's supervising absorbing the risk, right? So there's a lot of different kind of skin in the game when someone is saying that, that I am overseeing the work that you're doing and there's this additional check and balance that's inherently there that will not be there when someone's logging on to a group Zoom um, to absorb a PowerPoint presentation of materials. Really nicely stated. Yeah, and I think one thing that would be helpful for us is to kind of look at, are there pieces of this these modules that would lend themselves more into the consultation piece? Because I like that idea from both you and Dr. Beachy as well, um, versus some that are just so clearly PowerPoint kind of material and, and how that helps us kind of figure out this hours piece, for sure. Uh, this point said. Um, I just wanted to underscore that I think that so much of this ties back again into really figuring out the accelerated uh, option because otherwise you're going to have a huge bottleneck scenario if you're really putting an emphasis on apprenticeship and supervision, like who's going to be doing the, that supervision as we roll out the program or the, who's going to be in that mentor capacity. Um, so I think we, we have to figure that out to really have a robust experiential component um, and then I just wanted to second uh, Dr. Michi's comment about, uh, you know, requiring some synchronous aspect for the ethics. And I think, again, coming back to these ideas around role play, and it's not about memorizing information. It's about actually being able to ask questions and think about scenarios that are incredibly challenging and what would you do and, and work through that. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I agree with both those points for sure. Any other thoughts or questions? 
Dr. PT. Yeah, just really briefly, I think one way to reduce costs is to do group supervision and to do that as, you know, as much as possible. And that's how MAPS is reducing costs. And, you know, as someone who does a lot of groups, like facilitates a lot of group consultation, I think it's more helpful in many ways because you you get the experience of getting consultation on your own cases, but you hear the consultation other people are, are, are receiving and that could be invaluable. So I would agree. Uh, Mr. Ashton? Yeah, I, I guess my my question comes with that. I need to um, uh, kind of qualify it first, which is, uh, has there been uh, a range of like dosage recommended or or expected dosage um that we'll be utilizing because i i i think about you know as you kind of go up in dosage the um experience gets more intense for the for the participant and um and so too then must the skill of the facilitator and i'm i'm just wondering kind of how, you know, I'm thinking about this in, in a potential way in which we could utilize a, like a, an associate facilitator kind of role, which would be like an ongoing um, educational model, or, or, or at least it would maybe bring down the cost of, of a training program or could potentially, you know, bring down the amount of hours that, um, uh, demanded in the practicum experience and could help get associate facilitators kind of into rooms facilitating lower dosage experiences with like a lead facilitator on site who is on call and could support that associate facilitator if there was something that was needed. Um, I know kind of a, a big, big concept, big idea that I'm throwing out here, but I just kind of wanted to poke the bear on this a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's very much in line with the way clinicals are run in most Western settings, right? It's having that spirit, that supervisor available and and then having, you know, a, a model where even associate facilitator could get paid, but maybe at a lesser rate. Mr. Brownlee, I saw your hand up. I was I was going to skip to you. I, I was just going to say, uh, what, we're going to talk about this, just um, the products. Okay. Dr. Hancom, I, I acknowledge your anxiety with tomorrow, and I also want to be really, really respectful of time, so I'll be super brief here. Um, to answer your question or to provide some thought around the you know number of hours, I think that's really dependent on the levels or tiers of licenses around facilitation. I know right now we're talking about maybe a facilitator one and a facilitator two, and I know that in this conversation there has been some talk about segmenting out the different you know scopes of hours and things to that regard um i'll point out a piece where this is an interesting juxtaposition because we acknowledge that the hours should likely be higher than oregon but if we set too high of hours that's also going to be exclusive to certain populations or what could be more of a dynamic is pushing folks who would be qualified for a regulated model to move into the underground or community model. So that's an interesting, you know, aspect as well. You know, one of the things that I've seen in my involvement with the Zendo project is that somebody will go through a, um, a specific, let's say, quote unquote, training for a specific or, uh, event, and then they're all of a sudden Zendo project certified. Zendo Project doesn't have any type of certification. And so I just want to raise that as a part of this, you know, dynamic. And so, you know, to me, it seems like this sweet spot of approachableness. And then maybe there's an opportunity to add additional hours. If let's say you were moving into a facilitator two license, a facilitator three license, if there's more than just that, um, you know, duality there. I also had a few comments just around experience the, this draft itself but i don't know if this is the right time for that it might just take me like 60 seconds to comment on a few things I'd love that thank okay. you um in in number three a three i would vote or i don't vote at all but i would uh call to add in um financial abuse um as most of these psychedelic services actually are segues into non-psychedelic holistic services and I've seen folks sell coaching programs, you know, of a wide variety of things. So I think financial abuse is actually a factor here. 
I would also invite an elder abuse as well, knowing that we're dealing with vulnerable and marginalized, you know, uh, folks, um, particularly in Colorado, knowing that elder abuse also covers folks over 18 with disabilities. So that leads me to think about our neurodivergent population, especially folks with autism who will be looking into, you know, these services. Um, as I look to G, I think nine, um, I wrote a note here that screening and vetting should actually be separate from the preparation modules. I actually would highlight that screening and vetting should have its own, you know, modules there. And that wouldn't make sense for that to be falling into the uh, preparation side. Um, I'm looking at item I here and inviting in just more emphasis on community and non and ongoing non psychedelic support services. As a part of integration, what I find is that folks in integration benefit greatly from community models and more integrative models that aren't necessarily all related to psychedelic service. Um, I also had a point on um, item J, which is the training and navigating of both client and facilitator complaints on report and abuse. As a quick segue, what I find is that the majority of client complaints, we've done 1,100 programs through Psychedelic Passage, and the majority of what I find is actually expectation setting. And there's probably 80, 90% of those complaints, which is just like, you know, did the facilitator lay out what the administering session would look like, which was also another comment um, that I had on the administrating, you know, session side, like, are you able to successfully convey that to a client. They may walk in expecting this, they're undergoing this psychedelic experience of an altered state. And even that can cause, you know, some trauma and, and some, you know, things of that nature. Um, other than that, I, uh, I'm just kind of looking through my notes here. Um, I think we already chatted as a group and I was referencing item H where there, where there needs to be more emphasis on the space holding and service modalities and related, you know, in relation to that, but I know, that that's been um, brought up already. Uh, item G was where I was adding in a walkthrough of the sequence and expectations for administering sessions, as that's gonna be different based on modality, based on service provider. And then also there's this um, comment about referring out to other services. I actually think that one of the things that we do at Psychedelic Passes is actually referring to other facilitation services depending on speciality, depending on modality, like one of the things that we try to tackle is how do we actually create this fit between the right client for the right service? And I actually think that right now our model sits more on the consumerism model. It's like somebody comes in and then we then have, as a facilitator, have to adapt our services to be able to engage with that client, be paid with that client. So I actually think that that opens up all, an entire pathway on this cohort system that Dr. Beachy's talking about and a couple of other things where, you know, how do you actually refer, if a person is not in your profile of service, how do you actually refer that to another, um, you know, healing center or facilitator group? So that was a rapid fire, um, but I just wanted to be mindful of our time and, and thank you for, for hearing me. Oh, no, thank you. And, and if anybody wants to also submit suggestions to Sam or, or um, Lori in writing for us, that would be lovely to you. But I really appreciate those suggestions. That is very incredibly helpful. Dr. Kester. I was just, uh, actually, uh, you maybe just asked my question there. Uh, you were looking for a number. And you asked that at the beginning because you must be just a touch stressed out if you're presenting this tomorrow. Uh, and I was looking at Oregon's uh, requirements in terms of number of hours. And then I just literally went through the headings here and was like, how long bare minimum would it take to get through some of these headings? And that's if I'm flying and I've got my doctoral level folks that to hold some space for that too. They got 3000 hours under their belt before they even touch a patient. So like uh, on their own. And so, yeah, I mean, Oregon wants you know, some of this kind of clear with the presentation, Oregon wants 120 hours. That doesn't seem like enough. And so if you break down each one of these, and this is a tough, this is just a suggestion because I know this gets into the equity challenge and all these things we're talking about, but kind of going down the list, that was like, you know, I think you're more in the neighborhood of a minimum of 160 hours if we want a more robust program. Um, and you know, and I can I can write you or I can write Sam, sorry, and, and show you the breakout out. You can list it all out, but that's that's the way I look at it. With if I had people sitting in front of me that have 
hundreds of hours of biomedical experience and uh, clinical experience, I would say bare minimum, and this does not include the practicum, this is just didactic. I think um, 160 hours bare minimum to get through everything and work thoroughly, bearing in mind that we can do half of that asynchronously to help save time and cost. Um, so I'll, I'll send a breakdown um, to uh, through through Sam, get that out, see if I could, if that helps at all, based on the um, the headings that we have here, and and I especially would want to call out extra training, just like with Rob's today for trauma. I think that is an essential and such a valid piece that was brought up today, because trauma comes up. I mean, we see it all the time, you know, where somebody comes in for back pain and actually it's something else, uh, and so no, I think I think hopefully that helps, but that would be the number that I would pin on that for now. Plus, like bare minimum, I, I know that's already stipulated in the, uh, you know, already. But with the practicum and hour, practicum hours, but of course, programs, hopefully and should exceed that in order to provide the best training. Thank you so much, Dr. Kester. I really appreciate it. Um, Ms. Quintet. Um, well, I think Dr. Kester may have secretly been sitting in on some of our discussion groups because he just really echoed a lot of what I was going to say, um, which was that a lot of the feedback we got was just, you cannot fit this amount of material into the hours that are um, assigned to it in Oregon, or at least if you do, you're, you're racing through it. And then really, what's the value? Um, and I actually specifically heard from some of the you know really thoughtful training programs in Oregon that we had on the call that they did end up saying 160 hours was kind of where the where they settled i don't you know i'm not going to say that's the magic number but it was interesting to hear you say that um so yes just wanted to to add that um there and then mention one more thing just kind of coming back to james's comment i think it's a really interesting point this idea about um working with potentially lower doses for a given number of experiences and i know sam you mentioned that's going to be coming up in the products research and data subcommittee but i think it's worth highlighting too as it pertains to training and this experiential component so um just i think it has a place in the conversation here as well going forward lovely yes sam <laughs> yeah no i i appreciate that sasha uh, um, i yeah I, I think the challenge is definitely the first year before if we're trying to get uh, like training programs up and then before licensing portals, right. Um, and how that experiential applies, I think there's probably ways that we could, um, you know, how we address experiential and rules and leaving it up to training programs to, uh, not have to require it, but find avenues where, um, that could be done. I don't, I don't know. And I, but, um, I don't, I don't know if that's in the community access models, right? Like out, outside of the regulated access model or, um, if it's, uh, with ketamine or breathing exercises and how that's done the first year at least, right? Since we don't have licenses for facilitators, the licenses for cultivation facilities, uh, for tested product, um, and, uh, distribution. So. Be really helpful to know when products um, and data are going to talk about dosage, if possible. Yeah. You're not always able to attend those November, meetings, but I would love to attend. November, November 15th? Yeah, that's okay. the next date for products research and data. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I am aware of my time. I have a patient walking in the door here. And, and so I do need to wrap things up. I so appreciate everyone's participation and feedback. Um, I do feel like we're making good progress. Um, I feel a little more ready for the meeting tomorrow as well. So thank you everyone for all your hard work today and, and hanging with us um, through these hours. We really do appreciate it. Our last um, agenda item is just review of the future meeting date. Um, so I'm, I have requested to move our meeting to the AM partly for personal issues, but also because we have some board members that are subcommittee members that aren't able to attend, um, and hoping to make that, um, more doable for them. Um, so our next meeting date for the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday, November 16th, 2023 at 9 AM Mountain Standard Time. Um, so we meet regularly on every third Thursday of the month. Um, if any subcommittee members, voting subcommittee board members have any conflicts, please reach out to the program director, Lori Bratton, um, and we will work on finding a different time and day. Um, 
Other than that, I would like to thank everyone for your attendance and participation during today's meeting. Before we adjourn, there are a few items to be addressed. So the next meeting will be held on November 16th, 2023 at 9 a.m. Um, please remember that your attendance is necessary um, for, to ensure quorum for that meeting. Um, and we'll end with our attestation affirmations. Um, so do you attest and affirm that all conflicts of interest have been disclosed and that confidentiality of all board matters has been maintained since the previous board meeting? I do attest. Lundy? I do attest. Thank you. I don't believe Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes is with us. Dr. Sue Sicily? I attest. Thank you. Dr. Sophia Chavez? Dr. Chavez? Mm -hmm. um, Stacy Lux. I attest. Thank you. Billy Wynn? I attest. Thank you. I don't believe Skippy Upton Mesero is with us, and I also don't believe Dr. Brad Connor is with us. Um, so I do need to call a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. Lundy? Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. This meeting of the Qualifications, Training, and Licensing Subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. And we don't have Dr. Estes to do our blessing. <laughs> so I hope all, all stays well. And we'll see most people tomorrow. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Just give me a piece of getting.